YouTube P51D 1.2 meter June night. This is a beauty. It's got flaps, retracts, all the goodies you want. We're going to be flying it on 3200 4S with the brand new NX6. We have an in-depth look at this. We also do the radio setup as part of the build, uh, unbox, and radio setup that we always do on our regular reviews of these beautiful planes from Horizon. And yes, you can turn safe on and off, and you can run the flaps and retracts. This is not a six-channel transmitter. Don't worry. Even though it's called an NX6, just trust me. If you want to see the radio setup, stick around. We're going to pause it and get set and fly for you. All right, here goes nothing, guys. We got the takeoff flaps dialed in. We got just a little bit of breeze from our left to right, and here goes nothing. Beautiful. Man, that thing flies on rails. Look how solid it is. 3200 4S, that was about a 30% throttle. 100% right there. As you can see, she'll get up there just fine. Full landing flaps coming out. Watch her slow down, going downhill. What a beautiful bird you've got there. Ample power to get you out of all sorts of bad behaviors. We'll do a little dirty pass here. 15% throttle, full landing flaps, gear coming out. Look at that gorgeous thing. Out of the gear, through the window of opportunity. On 4S, guys, this thing will do just fine. Here we go. Mid-speed pass. All the way up for a stall turn. Wrong kind of stall. Out of the throttle all together here. Full landing flaps here. Look at that thing slow down, it's so gorgeous. Just a little bit of throttle, about 10%. Did you see it go almost straight up? Mm-hmm. Okay, down the runway, the opposite way. Little presentation pass. Beautiful. Guys, I love flying this plane. It is one of my favorites. It is definitely complained about more than any size class of beautiful and awesome plane. That is because we've seen a lot of them. But let me tell you something, guys. This plane is great. It flies good. It's got all the right habits for a warbird. And you can run it down the runway on the main landing gear without any trouble all day long if you want to. With this safe pack in here, we got a 4,000, excuse me, 4S 3200, full landing flaps deploying. Another dirty pass for you, just because it's so gorgeous. One wheel touch and go. Out of the flaps, out of the gear. Man, that thing has ample power. I would say truly unlimited vertical because you can gain speed going up. We'll just do a little inside loop for you here. Nice big lumbering inside loop here. And we'll roll out of that and come down the runway. Full speed pass. And around the house. What a gorgeous backdrop we've got for this plane too. We'll landing flaps here. We'll do a takeoff flat pass for you here. Granted, it's obviously going to be about in the middle, but you can cruise around 30% throttle. This thing just doesn't have any bad habits. It's probably a one minute warning, I believe, that just mm -hmm. beeped at me. That would be about right. Just watching out for the vampire killing zone because this plane is not a big plane. 
at 1.2 meters. Takeoff flaps here deployed. Out of the flaps and straight vertical. Okay, we are at 43, 42 seconds. As you can see, the 4S is exactly paired up for this plane perfectly. It is kind of a pain to fit it in the hole, just so you know. You're gonna have to cram and ram. But it's worth it. It's worth it, and it's good when you get it in. Neighbors. Gear coming out, full landing flaps. Let's see if we can slow it down in time for a touchdown. I kind of doubt it. That'd be cool if you could. Nine, Just to show you, you can do a landing on grass. Oh, that was pretty good timing. Yep. Okay, so complaints about this. First of all, we had one glitch. Horizon is already working on it. Secondly, the vibration is a little bit weaker than the DX18. Did you hear that? Those are two complaints. This is the bottom of the line card. That was the, well, the DX20 technically, but that was the top of the line card from Gen 1. That's it. Everything else is great. Um, and I'm not just saying that I really like this thing. It's good, all the different things about it are great. It does everything I expect from a radio and then it does it well, which is really great. Now, obviously I've only had a few flights on it. So, I mean, there could be other issues that I run into, but I doubt it, it's just been great. By the way, we're 42 seconds past timer. I felt like that uh, short approach is not good enough. So we're gonna take off with the takeoff flaps. Here we go, let's get that wheel up. Look at that takeoff guys, gorgeous, gorgeous takeoff. And by the way, this plane will make you look good, even if you're not. One minute over. One minute over. Gorgeous, totally gorgeous. Takeoff flaps deployed, going around for another landing. Landing gear coming out, about 30% throttle, full landing flaps, staying in at 30%. You do not want to let this thing fall out of the sky because you need power to keep pulling it through with those big barn door style flaps. I'm just into the grass today. Apparently. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about this battery. Throttle cuts on. That was a minute past, a uh, minute 34 right now. And we only did about a 45 second to a minute circuit there. Takeoff flaps, collapsed all the way. I didn't even show you guys safe, but we're gonna do that next with the uh, other battery pack. But first we're gonna pop out the battery. I'm gonna show you what I was talking about. This plane is a joy to put together. Um, you can have this thing in the air probably in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. That transmitter you can have set up fully to where we were in maybe a half an hour, depending on if you set up all the bells and whistles that I do. One complaint about the P51 1.2 is that this likes to crush. Yep. I had that on my other one, on the Blondie, and it's a little bit disappointing, especially the olive drab seems to show it a little bit more than the red did. You see how this thing's not all the way in? That battery tray is supposed to ride in with the battery and uh, for whatever reason, I can't get mine to slide in there with the bigger pack. If you put a 2200 in there, it'll go fine. But the thing is, it holds it perfectly still. So I've just been fine with just putting it in like this and sliding it in halfway. Um, I think what's happening is the Velcro is getting caught on the plastic. You can see by this mark there. So no big deal. Not overly hot, right, camera crew? Nope. Okay. So now let's go ahead and voltage test this. By the way, this is my second 1.2 meter. And what I meant by earlier, the most complained about plane is that the people in the RC world complain about P51s like they're not awesome. And then everybody buys them. Because Why? they, well, because we've had a million of them, but they're so good. 28% left. So we flew that pretty hard. If you didn't notice, I was doing a lot of high speed passes on 4S, this thing does great. On 3S, it does equally well. Um, but a little bit less on the unlimited vertical. I would say it's almost unlimited vertical on 3S, okay? So no puff, nothing, nothing to see. Nice, tight corners. That's what we like to see. Don't put those in your pocket. They didn't see you do that. No, they didn't. So what I'll, I'll just show you guys this process here. Normally you would slide your battery in here. Now, obviously this one's a little bit smaller. I happen to have a Velcro strip on it. So I'm just gonna slide this in and see if it'll stick. Nope, okay, that would have been nice for filming reasons. So normally you put this battery in here and then you just cinch it down tight. And once you get it down tight, then you slide it in the hole and I'll just show you exactly what happens. When you use the wider 3200 as opposed to the 2200 this was designed with in mind, you gotta remember the smart packs are smaller 
and more compact than the non-smart packs. The smart packs had not been released when this plane first came out that I know of, and if they were, it was a very new thing, okay? They weren't even a glimmer in Horizon's eye. Let's see if it goes. Nope, it's not gonna make a fool of me at least. All right, that makes me feel better. So I'm just gonna ram it in there until it won't go, and then I'm just gonna push that forward until it hits the front. I'm gonna go ahead and quickly, just like on my DX18, clear the timer, throttle cut set. By the way, this has Wi-Fi, which means when you do your firmware updates, you don't have to even take an SD card out. In fact, I don't even have an SD card in there. It will receive a micro SD card and it has regular micro USB plug for charging, which is really nice. So we're gonna fly again. In fact, we're gonna probably do a little back taxi too. So we'll come back here because the sun's over our shoulders now, which is kind of nice for filming. Um, I got a confession for you. We filmed this the other night, but it was so cold. I was like practically shivering the whole time. So we got decent flights, but this is technically our third and fourth flights. The wind was crazy this week. Yep. Let's come over here a little bit. Throttle cuts off. Timer's cleared. We got a five minute timer. We should have no problems with that timer. We'd probably get about six to seven minutes if we were to ride this all the way down to zero. 3S is of course gonna be a little bit less demanding on everything because I'm not gonna push it quite as hard. Very good ground handling with this plane. Nothing like the 1.5 meter, which is a little bit squirrely with the tailwheel. Look at that takeoff, gorgeous. Okay, we're gonna come back around, hon. Okay. That's full throttle, by the way. I kept trying to drag it out, but it just wants to fly so bad, I'm going into the wind and it's just gorgeous. There's a full speed pass on 3S, not quite unlimited vertical. See how it's wanting to fall out of, fall out of the sky at the top? I'd be lying if I said that was exciting compared to the uh, 4S. The 4S definitely does more for me in that arena. The get out of jail free card is definitely better on 4S, but it looks like I'm flying some sort of a driving radio controlled car here, guys. That's just how slow you can fly it out of the flaps into the full throttle. That is 100% throttle there. Bringing it around. A Little bit of down elevator. Obviously on this plane with the 3200 3S, we uh, would need to give it just a kiss of trim because we are all the way to the front with the battery, just like we were with the 4S. And by the way, on the 4S 3200, that was the first and only time we have seen the CG work out at the 85 millimeters from the wing root plus or minus three millimeters as per the instructions in the manual. I have no elevator correction whatsoever right now. No elevator correction whatsoever. So when I deploy those flaps, all you're getting is flaps. Okay, full landing flaps coming out again. Over the tree line, there is a little bit of a wind that you guys are probably not seeing demonstrated by any trees moving because most of the trees are losing their leaves. Dirty pass on 3S, look at that gorgeous dirty pass. Out of the flap, full throttle and rolling to the right so we can avoid the trees. Those trees were probably about 40 feet in front of me before I would have hit them. Going right over the top right now and then full speed pass. You can see it'll move, but it's just not as impressive as the 4S, still plenty impressive. Good looking scale performance, beautiful silver in the sunlight. Look at that gorgeous orange glow. Guys, I love the way it looks when you crest the other sunset up there. That's just so gorgeous. Hey, you were gonna do a little bit of safe flight before you get to five minutes. Okay, good idea. Okay, so we're out of safe. Safe's on. Okay, here we go. Full bank, that's right. Automatically levels, full bank left full bank right, full up, full down. Jeez, it lets you go like vertical. Okay, so now chop the throttle, full landing flaps. Not even looking. <laughs> Look at it. <laughs> Look at the attitude of the plane, that's hilarious. Okay, gear coming out. We'll try for a safe landing because we have a minute 40 left. 
into the throttle just a hair so we don't like fall out of the sky here. Okay, this is gonna be a safe landing if I can do it. Gotta get here, get here, P51, get here. So, as you can see there, that was safe. I made two minor corrections. I made a slight rudder correction to try to line it up with the main runway. And then I made a slight elevator correction, which is why it bounced incidentally. So we are gonna just taxi in the grass if it'll taxi, take off flaps, not landing flaps. We're gonna come out of safe and we're gonna try to do a 3S taxi and see if we can get it moving for takeoff. Let's go back 10 steps right now. Ooh, see? That's where you wanna be careful with this plane because yep. it does like to pivot on those gears. So throttle cuts on. You may have trouble if you've got grass like this, but I think you could probably do a grass takeoff if you don't hit a rock or anything. You're just gonna have to be ready to get on it. Here's a trick. Nah, ain't gonna work. Too many, too many rocks right here. Yep. So the wheels are just a little bit too small for this yard. But if you had sod, you could do sod. So let's show them sod over here. Some of you guys fly off of grass. These wheels will work, but you gotta have pretty well manicured lawn. So right here probably. Okay, so this is a little bit more manicured. I just hit my timer. There you go. She's in the air, off of the grass. Oh, it's so gorgeous. Look at that silhouette. Take off flaps there. Okay, we're at zero time. So usually not a good time for a hammerhead, but we'll just do it anyway. Okay. Gorgeous. Okay, coming back around. You may stay or come with you. No, you're good. Okay. You can just stay there. Take off flaps coming out. Get into conservative flight mode. Going for a really wide turn. We're gonna see if we can get a gorgeous landing. Vampire killing zone. I was trying to use up all the runway and I evidently did. Okay, so I'm a minute and 18 minutes or 18 seconds past my five, but we did land. So I'm gonna go ahead and take off and do another circuit. I hate to land crappy for my last landing. Okay, here we go, full throttle. Get it off the ground, get those gear up. Take off flaps, going for conservative flight here. Got a little bit of wind. Okay, you wanna to go to my right. Thank you, very good. Okay, here we go. Take off flaps going down, landing flaps rather. Landing gear coming out, coming over the vampire killing zone here. And here we go. We're just gonna stay in the throttle about 10%. And just fly it to the ground, baby. Woohoo! Look at that. That was not a very long landing strip that was needed there. No, really. uh, and we do not have a tremendous amount of land, or excuse me, a, a tremendous amount of wind. So if you figure on, this is 37 feet wide here. That's supposed to be 15 feet, but it's not. It's more like 20 some. So we're probably 65 feet for that landing strip right there. So 65 feet by 10, that is a short landing strip. Most of your fields are gonna be longer than that. Um, our entire driveway I think is about 180 feet. So, but that includes a little bit of down and a little bit of bend. And so we don't usually take that except for maybe slow down area. Mm -hmm. Beautiful plane. Guys, Horizon, good job. The NX6 is great, really happy with it. I was scared to death when this thing came out. We were gonna have to learn some new system that's gonna suck or it's gonna be a pain to learn. And it has been everything, but it's all the things that I liked about before. It just does it faster, it does it better. It's got a better display, it's got better gimbals. Everything feels like the DX18. And this is the bottom of the line card, meaning the cheapest one. Uh, it's got that, I don't really think that's a big deal. Um, I'm sure somebody out there needs that, but I 
I don't particularly need that, but we also fly like one plane at a time around here. So it's not, not a big deal. Beautiful plane, the P-51. I knew it was gonna be good when I started reviewing it. There was never a question in my mind that this was gonna be one of the best, most gorgeous planes I've ever flown because it really is. And guys, if you haven't got this plane already, it's definitely one to have in the hangar. It's beautiful. Stick around for the build. We've got the unbox, build, radio setup with this, not the DX18 obviously, because we use this. And then we also have our unbox and first thoughts on this at the end. Um, most of them are about fit and finish and then putting in the extra battery that we got. We got a bigger battery that comes with this. It runs on lithium ion pack uh, as opposed to a lithium polymer. Um, and we talk about charging that and the different cables and things that we know about so far, which there's, there's more to come. Anyway, guys, bells and whistles. I haven't even learned most of them, but I can tell you this, this does everything I need to do most of the time, because to be honest with you, how many planes do I have that are actually over eight channels? I have maybe two, two. one or two, but even those, you know, you're limited to mixes. But really, most of the time, you're not gonna be doing mixes. You can fly all the best, coolest planes with this. So if you wanna make a little bit more investment, you get the DX, excuse me, the NX-8. It's gonna take a long time to break that habit. Mm -hmm. Or the NX-10 if you really wanna go crazy. And then if you really, really wanna support the channel, check the link in the description below and buy an IX-12 or an IX-20. <laughs> and then you can have pretty much a smartphone built into this too, which is super nice. Anyway, beautiful plane, both good choices. If you're looking for a Christmas present or somehow you manage to upset your husband because it's usually the other way around, then buy him this. Or if you upset your wife and she's into airplanes, P-51 plus NX-6 equals like a hundred, a hundred, is it like a hundred sets of flowers? A hundred sets of flowers. This is one of my favorite planes, still. It's gorgeous. Yep. And by the way, Full disclosure, I really like the blondie. I like the red, but yep. you know what? This thing looks gorgeous in the sky, especially in the fall with all the leaves off. It just has a beautiful, beautiful lines on it. Yeah. The silver's gorgeous. You know, this one little complaint here with that, you're never gonna notice it in flight. Nope. You never will. But I'll tell you what, you will notice how gorgeous this thing is in flight. Yeah. And it really is that. So come back for more. Stick around guys. We're gonna do the unboxing build next. Thanks for watching. YouTube, Brian Phillips here, coming to you with another unboxing. This is gonna be deja vu squared. You're probably thinking to yourself, what do you mean, Brian? What's this you're slinging this morning? Um, we've already reviewed this one, but the thing is, it wasn't mine. It was my wonderful cameos. So now this one's mine. It was? Yes. It was. So, oh yeah, the P-51. Are you kidding me? It's just like a new release, except it's not. Now here's the thing, guys. The P-51 is an awesome plane. This is a 1.2 meter, okay? So I had the Blondie, what started my career. It was like maybe my second or third plane. And it was awesome. And I still have it to this day and it still flies. It's been crashed many a times. So I'm very excited to be able to breathe some new life into my P-51 experience. Yes, I did review another P-51 that was a 1.5 meter, but that thing is beautiful and it's definitely something else. It's a lot harder to fly. This thing is way easier to fly. I know it flies good. You're probably thinking to yourself, why are you opening the box so stupidly? Well, I'm just trying I something new, thinking. trying something new, see? See how much less stressful that was? That worked, that worked really nice. Okay. Wow, that thing is gorgeous. Ooh, look at that. That is beautiful. White tip, black spinner. I liked the red front on the Blondie yep. a little better. We have another cameo. Yes, we have another cameo. That's Callie. She just needs a drink. She, yep, she needs a drink, so she's coming to find Dad's drink. Okay, so here we go. There's the gear down. Now this thing has retracts and it's got flaps and it's basically a five channel plane. The tail wheel does not go up on a 1.2 meter. On the 1.5 meter, it does come up. So without further ado, we're gonna jump straight into the unboxing. All right, YouTube. So we just got done talking a little bit about the NX6, which was the first time we reviewed that. 
and so we spent a long time, sorry. This is the unbox part of the P51. This is an awesome plane. I have flown it before and you're like, but you're unboxing it now. How have you flown it before? Well, because my buddy, um, my flying buddy Esteban had this and I flew it and it was awesome. And I helped him set it up. I think I used a DX8 for that one. So really good plane. I've already had the P51 1.2 meter Blondie and that was one of my first planes. And if you're asking, well, does that mean this could be my first plane? Mm, you probably shouldn't do it because the landing gear, it's got, uh, it's got landing gear up front and it does sit pretty tall. And you know, like if you have a really huge landing strip with safe, you could fly this as your second or third plane without too much trouble. But when you say one of your first, it was probably more like your sixth or Sport something. Cub in them that was inside that was a little 10 gram indoor flyer um those were kind of at the same time at the beginning mm -hmm. then i went to the delta ray mm -hmm. and this was one of the early ones well, yeah it was it was like my third plane maybe really second or third yeah huh. yeah and i i would have said there's more in between but no, there really wasn't. So we're gonna unbox this. So I guess I, I need to have a knife because the way they've taped it in there. We upgraded our knife. You're welcome, YouTube. Mostly because my son broke our really crappy one. Because <laughs> it's like older than our marriage. That's right, it was actually. I'm pretty sure it was. <laughs> yeah. So we've upgraded our knife. It just upgrades all over the place. 17 years out of a knife. Do drop good. tanks. With my original P51, I dropped these onto a government building. And the government, the government, the government official gave them back to me. I was like, so I bombed you with my drop tanks and then you bring them back. This is, this is government work at its best, right? Okay. So we got the spinner over here. I like the red one on the Blondie. I love the red on the Blondie. Yeah. So pretty. And then the Texan was a yellow and yellow and silver, I think. Okay. I like the invasion stripes like this though on the bottom. Mm -hmm. They're really pretty. When they go on the top and the bottom, it can make it a little bit hard for inverted, you know, versus being straight up and down. Okay, so, oh, that's the other thing we forgot to mention in that little radio setup video or radio video. There was a manual on the bottom. Of course, I'm not gonna read that thing. <laughs> you can read it but if you want. But if you, you wanted want. to know what it all does. Horizon does a really good job with their manuals, bind and fly planes, okay? So this is gonna tell you what you need to know for setup. We'll get back to that when we do the build. Uh, okay, so the prop, beautiful painted yellow tips, not painted on the backside, and it's a 10.58. So it's eight inches or of forward movement with one revolution. I believe that's what that means, and then 10.5 would be this measurement here, okay? So that's true for all props. So 10.5 by eight, and that speaks to the pitch of the, of the blade, okay? So if you need to replace that and you can't get the Horizon one for some reason. Um, also four blades versus two blades. Which one's more efficient? Two blades, because there's a lot of drag with the propeller blades. Oh, gorgeous. This wing is so gorgeous, guys. Look at this, really beautiful, very nice finish. This 1.2 meter, don't discount the 1.2 meter. I know I reviewed the 1.5 meter P51, which is amazing. It's also very expensive and it's also a lot more scary to fly because you, I mean, I don't know, if you're like me, there's just more riding on it. So we have a few planes coming that are gonna be a little bit bigger than what we've reviewed in the past and I'm excited to bring them to you. But 1.2 meter is a wonderful size. It is a great size. You can get this into the back of your car if you're careful, especially the P51, it seems to fit. The P47 is actually a little bit bigger wingspan um, and the P51 is gorgeous. It looks a lot like this, but I just love the lines of the P51. Gorgeous wing flaps, large flaps too. Um, and I got mine to where they'll crank all the way down like that. And they are just barn door flaps. And you have the wide flight envelope on this. 
Uh, you can fly this plane. It feels like you're barely moving and then you can go blazing fast. It's just, it's a wonderful experience. Okay, so horizontal stabilizers. Okay, make sure you have a left and a right. Okay, slides in there. And then usually I work the surfaces a couple of times. These are actually really nice. I don't even feel like I have to work the surfaces. Doesn't look like a lot of play on there, but that's okay, it'll be plenty good. And then of course the control horn is integral to the mechanism that wraps around the foam. Uh, these wings also have a lot of reinforcement. I didn't talk about that much, uh, but it's hard to see through the silver. I don't think we're gonna be able to give you. Yeah. There's a wing spar, there's a wing spar. There's actually several wing spars in this wing and it's very reasonably stiff, okay? All right, so we've got a little bit of foam to protect the foam. Just, oh, look. Stuff in here, it was underneath that. So you'll wanna look for that. It was right here in that spot. So be mindful of that. Horizon does a really nice job on their packaging. One of the best jobs of any of the manufacturers. This foam is nice and hard, um, but then they protect everything with the softer foam, which is really nice. And then we have a wing spar. For the horizontal stab here. Okay, so that one's hollow. Okay, carbon fiber. Got a little bit of flex to it. Obviously when you put that together, that goes into these little receivers here. Slides in really well refined. No trouble at all getting those things in. And I don't know if you guys can tell, but they have sanded the tip of this. Cause they don't always go in easy like that. No, they don't. Believe me, sometimes you really gotta work it to cram it in there. Okay. So this is the June night, if I didn't mention that earlier. Woo. Horizon does replicas of scale planes from history. And uh, man, it's so weird how much static comes off of these things. Do you feel I know, that? Especially this time of year. So They're weird. Like crazy. Beautiful lines. Look at that. So gorgeous. The canopy is just glorious. I love this pilot. It's so well detailed. And then the instrument cluster, of course. Oh no, my label's lifting. That's no fun. Other than that, I just love the way that this looks. And that little vent hole on the back, it's just gorgeous coming at you. That is so cool. And then this here, we've got the EFLM 41. 15, which is an 850 kV, uh, of course, 4115, I believe 41 speaks to the diameter and then 15, I'm not sure what that speaks to. Anyway, you can look it up if you really care. That's available from uh, just right on horizonhobby.com. If you're looking to replace it, you just have to figure out your equivalents because I never know. The air scoop looks super cool. The finish is nice on this, not maybe as nice as some of the even more detail, but look how nice this is here. The like fuse the doesn't even have like these release dimples. Mm -hmm. Like those are lifted. It's really cool, those rivets. And then of course the exhaust tubes off the engine, so cool. Uh, steerable tail wheel, but not retractable. Not really a big deal breaker for me. The retractable tail wheel, um, you know, to me it's, it's, it's cool, but it's not like that big a deal. Honestly, on the bigger P51, it was so much faster and I felt like I was farther away all the time. So I never actually noticed it. Um, whereas with this thing, you won't notice it either. So unless you're sitting there looking for it, you won't notice it. Um, so that's all the pieces. So I guess without further ado, we're going to go ahead and pause it. We'll get this stuff cleaned up and we'll come back for the build. Okay guys, so we're back. We're gonna start charging a couple of batteries. Um, smart batteries automatically discharge themselves, which is really nice for guys like me that have batteries from 7,000 milliamp hours down to just small 2,200 milliamp hours and everything in between. And if you're anything like me, you've got a bunch more than that even. Um, so when I get ready to fly a plane, I don't wanna have to worry if they're gonna be charged 
So I used to keep them charged all the time. Now that is really hard on the chemistry of the packs. And so as a result, I have a lot of packs that got basically destroyed in storage. So not like caught on fire and destroyed, but just like they don't work anymore. Okay. It's at 31%, so it was already at charge rate. Look at this, 3.8 perfectly balanced at 3.8. Okay, so that's one battery. Then let's uh, bring out a 4S. And we're also on this power supply, we're charging the NX6 that we talked about a little bit. Not sure if that's gonna fall at the very end of the video, the unbox part, or exactly how that's gonna work. Okay, so we've got that at 3.82, so we'll just click and start. So those are gonna charge up to 4.2 volts per cell. And then of course, if we wanna have more batteries ready to go, I'll plug in my S2100, which is a dual channel, meaning there's two batteries can be plugged in. They do not have to be the same. And then I'm gonna plug in my S1100. There's no easy way to do this without sounding like a sales pitch, but these, these batteries have been awesome. They've been very good. And you wanna know how many batteries we destroyed so far? Zero. Oh wait, there was one, cause I had a plane break on me. The nose ripped out. It was not. Oh. It was not the battery's fault. It's not the battery's fault. But it was right. fun because we destroyed it. <laughs> okay, so the S1100 starts automatically. So it's charging the 3S. Okay. And then this one's a two channel. So you see I've got a 3S and a 4S here. I'm gonna just plug this in. And just to show you, you don't even have to plug in your balance lead. You just plug in the smart lead then this little carrier here, this channel here, this is where all the signal happens. And that communicates to the smart chip, which is in the smart battery, okay? So just so you can see they're hooked up, I'm just gonna click the button and I'm gonna click this and click start. Perform without the balance lead, yes. Okay, now I'm gonna click channel two. I'm gonna click and click, scroll to yes, whoops, and then click. And then you can view one or you can view both simultaneously, which is really nice. So if you guys are looking for a charger right now, this is the S20, uh, the S1200, which is a 200 watts at eight amps. This is the S1500, which is 500 watts, I believe. And it goes up to like 16 or 12 amps. It's a lot. You can charge a battery really fast. I have them set to charge at um, basically just one S. So on a 2200, it'd be 2.2 amps. So it's gonna get these things charged real quick. But while we're getting ready to fly a plane that will use either a 3S or 4S, we just have them going and ready to rock and roll. Now, if you just want one, I think the best value out of this whole bunch is probably the S2100. I feel like the S1100 is probably the best operating because it's so easy. You don't even have to press start. You literally plug it in and it goes. So these ones are gonna be the most expensive, but you can charge way faster. So if you're going for the fastest, you'd want the Spectrum 30 amp power supply, and they also offer a smaller power supply, by the way, but these are the bigger ones. And you can run more than one of these on one of these. And you can also do parallel charging, and you can do series charging too. I haven't messed with that yet. And the USB on the power supply is nice. And then mm -hmm. you Oh, can and you can use another battery Yes, as the input say. voltage yep. on these ones. So like if you want to take this 7,000 milliamp pack, get the adapter from IC5 to IC3, then you could charge many of these small packs using the power from this monster. Yep, and we've even done that in an emergency situation to use it as a charger for- phones. We charged our phones on that during, there was a duration that hit Iowa. Um, would have been two months ago mm -hmm. and a lot of people lost power for a, a, a period of time like we only lost power for what about like two days two, two days, and a half two days. days so we had a generator running the whole house but it was just like you know we didn't want to run everything and also my camera crew did not have power until i got home and we set it up because it was the first time we had ever had to run our whole house on a generator yep so anyway without further ado we're going to get back to this setup and build so obviously we get this P51 here, everything is laid out nicely. And so I've got this robot, robot stand and that really will make your life easy. If you plan on doing more than a handful of models a year, 
I would definitely get one of these. Uh, the storage is maybe not great because it's a little bit big and it's extremely hard to slide these things off. Some people will use a white lithium grease to make these things slide easier. We just happen to have our house configured to work on planes all the time and you probably don't if you're a normal human. Okay, so the first step on any of these bind and fly planes would be to typically go to the instruction manual. It's gonna talk about your transmitter setup. There's a chart coming up, the dual rates, center of gravity marks. It's plus or minus 85, uh, 85 millimeters plus or minus three from the leading edge at the root. So meaning at the root would be defined as this point right there. So 85 millimeters back, not 85 millimeters flat like this. So you don't cut the paper and lay it down on there. You just measure 85 millimeters straight back. Okay. Does that make sense to you camera crew? Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll use calipers for that. If you have calipers, it's very easy to do it because you've got a pretty good amount of curve on this wing for the, um, the airfoil shape. Okay. So, the next page is going to be telling you how to start the assembly process. I'm just going to scroll through here. This is the computerized setup. Okay. So in our case, we are going to be using the NX six, but the NX six, I'm going to treat just like, you know, basically the DX 18 section, because it's going to be the same as that, I believe. So it talks about building the prop later in the build. I'm just looking for order reasons because I want to see when they suggest to do what. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in this case, we're going to basically, I'm going to start with the, with the prop just because I want to get that out of the way because it's like super easy to do right now. Okay. So the motor's here, this thing goes on, it's got a little texture to it and the texture lines up on this texture. Okay. And then that helps to transfer the spinning and you can see it spins free and you're like, well, how's that going to hold? There's another piece coming. So the prop goes on there. There's no texture there. You can tell it's going forward when it spins counterclockwise. It should go that way. It should blow air back. Okay. So this is in the C bag. There's a single screw and this is the prop adapter. I'm not sure what you call that. You just kind of spin that on there until it's pretty tight, like finger tight. And you can tell it's already basically good, but I'm going to still find an appropriate sized, whatever, slide it in there. And then I'm just going to torque this down really tight. Okay. So that's super tight. Now I'm going to take the spinner and slide this down so that it's on. And then this must be the screw. Now this screwdriver is just a little bit too big to fit in the holes. So you have to go to a smaller screwdriver, even though it's kind of got big threads. Actually, we're going to pause it and we'll get a better screwdriver. So I got one of my Chinese screwdrivers. Sometimes they're the best screwdrivers because you get better purchase in certain sizes. And so we have a variety of these I don't know if you want to call them precision screwdrivers. Ah, having trouble getting that slid in there. There we go. You can do that before you put it together. And just get that little lip to, sit, to seat. Okay. And remember, this is just holding the spinner on. Okay, so that's on there. And then just give it a spin, make sure everything looks solid. It looks solid. Okay, so now that that's on, we're gonna assemble the tail feathers next. The tail feathers, of course, are really easy. You have three pieces. You have the carbon fiber rod that goes between them, the joiner, the wing joiner. And then you've got the left and the right. Now, how do you tell which way goes up and down? Uh, on this one, it's really hard to tell, but on this one, it's really easy to tell because you've got the control horn that comes out the bottom. And you can tell because that's where the control is over here. 
See this? So that's what you're gonna end up hooking to. So I'm gonna slide this in. Sometimes these are kind of a bear cat to get in because they're tight. See how it's wanting to squish the foam as you go? So it's in there now, wasn't too bad. Then I'm gonna slide this through. Now this is plastic and this is foam, but it's all painted together so it looks the same. Then I'm gonna slide this on just like this. And this one's a little bit more of a bear cat because you've got that lip of foam that wants to get crushed as you go. All right, so she's in there. And then there's two screws to go from the top down. Uh, it looks like I have a bag with a B on it. I don't even like pay attention to what, see, cause that says B. Oh, look, it actually says B. Hey, that's right. That's nice. Cause this that's is amazing. an older model. <laughs> Back in the day, they used to label all their bags. All the nut sacks had letters on them. And they were right. And they were correct, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna go back to the Chinese small screwdriver here. And we're gonna get in there like this. The noise you hear is the foam rubbing on the foam. You don't have to worry about any damage from that, which is nice. Okay, so get that so it's nice and tight. And sometimes people complain about some of the horizontal stabilizers get glued on. And these are screwed in, which is nice because if you have a really big space issue and you need to take your planes apart, you can technically do that. Of course, I'm not gonna take my planes apart because I'm way too lazy. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a little bit of room. So now the antenna technically goes here, but I'm not gonna put that on. I would not recommend gluing this. I guess I am gonna put it on because I've got it open. So if you lay this flat on the table, See, it's gonna to tip to one direction versus the other, okay? So that's tipped one way, and that's tipped, where is it? Oh, no, it's right here. See how this plane is up a little bit, right here, from here to here? It goes up a little bit, and that's how you tell which way it goes in. Because then it, it follows the contour of the plane, okay? So that's pretty simple stuff. So now the thing that's nice about that, if you don't leave this in here, you can pop this out when you go to transport your antenna and you can lay it off to the side. All right, so the tail's built. Uh, we have to hook up the control rod. So that's what we're gonna do right now. So that's right here. And they're recommending we go to what position? This is one of the steps that they will tell you right here. So on this, this is gonna be for the elevator. They're suggesting the outside hole, okay? So I almost always want more output than is recommended in the manual. But on this one, I guess I'm just gonna to go to the outside hole, okay? So the outside hole, slip this through and click. Then this goes down most of the way. Okay, I'm, I haven't even adjusted this. I have done nothing to it. At some point, we're gonna to have to make sure that all this stuff centers up nicely, okay? For now, we're not gonna mess with it. Same thing with the rudder. The rudder is actually on the inside hole by default. That's crazy. Um, that's good. And now I wanna show you one other thing. This is the arm on the servo, and this is the horn on the control surface. And they tell you which hole they're supposed to be in. So like the arms for the elevator are on the second one out and the last one out. So there's a lot of precision on the elevator and a lot of torque, okay? Or a lot of precision and a little bit less torque. If you go out here, you're gonna move further and, and you're gonna have a little bit less torque. See, more control, less control. Just because you have more output does not mean you have better control. You have more deflection but you have less power behind the deflection. So keep in mind, when you have a control surface that's moving and there's pressure being exerted on it from the wind going across it, it, so to speak, or the forward motion of the aircraft, all those molecules are pushing on the surface and that servo only has so much torque on its actuation. So if you go to the inside, you're gonna have more precision because it's not moving as far. So it's, if you want this much output on your elevator and you command that with your elevator control on your stick, then it's gonna be more likely to stay in that position because it's also got a little bit more power behind it. 
But if you go all the way out, then you're gonna move it further, but you're gonna have less power behind that movement. Okay, did that make sense, camera crew? It did. Okay. Now, that being said, if you guys are building this plane, it's probably, I wouldn't say this is just a, you know, like for noobs or anything like that. This is a very good plane and a lot of experienced pilots would go for this plane. Uh, it is a P-51 and there's a lot of them on the market, but this is one of the best. Uh, Horizon does a really nice job on their P-51s. So the next step is to uh, go ahead and put the wing on, it looks like. You may have noticed I'm not doing this in order, but it doesn't matter. I'm just doing it because it's easy to film and that's what's sitting in front of me. Okay, so in order to do this, I have all these wires, okay? So let's just talk about what they are. We have one that says gear. We have another that says gear. We have one that says aileron. We have one that says aileron. We have two that say flaps, okay? So those all have to go through the hole. So my plan is to try to feed these wires in as I, you're gonna have to get the angle, hon, because I can't really avoid this. I'm just gonna try to slop these in here. Okay, and then we'll go around from the front. Okay, and then I just slide this back and then drop it down. Okay, so it's in. Now we need to get some screws in there. That was pretty easy. Mm -hmm. It's not done yet. So the screws are from the A bag and these are supposed to be the C bag. So remember how we were talking about the labels being right? Well, one for six. Spoke too soon. I was like, I, I would never have said that, <laughs> but you did. Okay, so then uh, we've got these drivers. Just show them the tip of this here, camera crew. I should like break down and make a holder that's gonna put these in size order. Yeah, I don't know what size If I only need. you had some like foam or garbage sitting around. Yeah, right. Okay, so we get that started. Then we're gonna come back here and get this one started. Then we're gonna come over here and we're gonna get this one started. Man, that tool is nice. It is. And then we're gonna get this one started. Okay. There's a lot of threads on these things. Mm -hmm. Now watch what's happening. Look at the foam, look at it crush. Give them a super ultra close up. You see it crush? Okay, that's where you wanna kind of stop is when you start seeing deflection of foam. You see the deflection of the foam? See it? Starting to bulge, mm -hmm. okay. See, it's pulling it down now. So what's happening is the plastic is gonna pull down on a larger surface of foam. Obviously you couldn't just put a, a screw through foam because it wouldn't hold the foam. You have to have something to back it up to make that bite point wider. You see how it's starting to get stretch marks here? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's when you usually quit. Now, that being said, foam planes, occasionally you gotta tighten those things. If, you know, maybe three, four flights in, you might have to torque them down again. But it's, it's not hard, it's a couple of turns. And drop tanks are real easy on these. They've got a slot here that goes from front to back. And so they slide from the front of the wing back. There's sometimes a little bit of a pain to get in there. I thought it broke, but it didn't. Oh, there's a clicker on it. Yeah, it just clicked on me. Okay, I don't believe they're left and right labeled, so they just go in there. They're ambidextrous. Okay, cool, so we've got, I told you this build would be easy. Still one of them. Look at that beauty. Oh yeah, it's all together. Now that being said, we still have some wiring to do, and we obviously still have radio set up to do, but that's pretty quick. It is. Okay, so now on this plane, you can lift the whole thing up, and you can pull out, okay? What I've done in the past, they have a piece of tape here, and that piece of tape was part of the manufacturing process 
to get this thing to, to stay in there when they glued it, because there's a magnet that holds the back in, okay? So now you'll also notice that this plug is an EC3 instead of an IC3. That stands for E-Flight Connector, and three speaks to, I don't know, probably like the current rating and the size class. So at this point, we need to get those wires hooked up, but I'm gonna get a pair of scissors and we're gonna cut that stupid label off. This label just gets in your way when you're working and then. Just don't cut your fingers off with your problem. Yeah, don't cut your fingers off. That would really ruin your day. Mm -hmm. And speaking of safety for a moment, there's two things in an airplane, two, two things in radio controlled hobby that are dangerous. And when I say dangerous, the most dangerous, and it is not flying into yourself. Although those things can happen, it's extremely rare. Uh, most people have uh, built-in self-preservation <laughs> and they, they don't end up getting hit unless they're filming and they're very in depth. <laughs> so most of the time, the dangers you gotta watch out for are batteries and props. So why batteries? Because lithium polymer is a very, um, it's a very energy packed chemistry. And so as a result, there is a certain inherent danger. You need to be very careful when you're charging. You have to be careful when you discharge. You have to be careful when you're using them and you have to keep them in good shape. And if they're not in good shape, just figure out a way to dispose of them without disheartening yourself too much because they're kind of expensive. So that being said, if you take care of them, you don't have to generally throw them away. The airplanes will take care of that for you. Now, the other thing is cutting yourself. Throttle cut is one of the most important rules of thumb and finger. If you set a throttle cut, <laughs> you, will, you will be less likely to cut your fingers or thumbs off or your face or whatever. Okay, all right, so real quick, this is a Spectrum AR636B. I have it on good word that those things are gonna be going away pretty quick. I don't know if I can talk about that anymore, but uh, I really like the 636B. It was a great receiver. Um, I have it in many, many, many of my planes. Okay, so I'm just pulling the slack up here so I can plug things in. So we've got two longer ones, which are my gear wires. Yeah, gear wires, they were kind of the small ones. There are a little bit thinner wires, which is weird. You'd think they'd be real thick because there's a little bit of juice that's needed to run those retracks. Okay, there's the throttle there that's already plugged in. Looks like the elevator and rudder are already plugged in. So let's look in the manual for a second. It's calling out a Y cable for the flaps and a Y cable for the gear and a Y cable for the ailerons. It looks like the flaps are gonna plug into six, gear to five, ailerons to two. So in this bag, we have a handful of Y cables. So let's drop those out. They are labeled nicely for you, which is pretty cool. What would have been wise would have been to hook these up and then send them through the wing. But I just kind of forgot that step. No big deal. You do have plenty of length in here. You can get them hooked up still. Okay, so this is for flaps as it's been labeled. And so I'm just gonna look for flaps and then plug those in. Camera crew, can you get this at all? Mm -hmm. So brown goes to brown, orange goes to orange. So as you line these up, my fingers are gonna cover up a lot of this happening right now. So we apologize for that in advance. Make sure it's plugged and then give it a quick tug. Make sure it doesn't undo. They do kind of have a bit of a, like a connection uh, resistance that you can feel when you get fully penetrated, what's the worst thing you can do? Half penetration? I was gonna say. Quarter penetration? I mean, sometimes it's kind of nice to just like start out with a, like a low penetration level and then just ram it in after it's ready. That's the best way to do it. There it is. Oh, did you hear the pop? Okay, so there's our flaps. Okay, so I'm just gonna lay this aside before I plug it into the receiver. Okay, so this is ailerons, or ale, it is not beer. Okay, there's one aileron. I am ale. 
ale, Leron. Okay, so now I'm gonna push this in. That didn't feel very tight. See how reasonably easy that was to undo? Yeah. That's not super promising. Okay, so the yellow is going to my right side. And in this case, it kind of looks like yellow, but it's orange. Okay. So we're just plugging those both in. Got nice, good amount of length there. Okay, so then the gear. All right, so gear. These are gonna be super long. That's what she said. Hey, cut it out, battery connector. Get out of the way. I'm putting that under that piece of wood, that plywood there. Okay, so this is gear. So the brown goes to the right. Okay, plugged in there. I want this to go under first for cable management reasons. Okay, and then I'm gonna grab my last gear wire. Brown goes to the left this time, and brown goes to the left. Plug it in, double check, give it a tug. All right, we should be good to go. So now we'll look at the instruction manual again uh, to refresh our memory. Flaps are six, gear is five, so I grab gear first. Brown goes down, you can tell because there's already plugs in there. And if you can't tell, there's a little delimination here that says minus plus signal. So minus is the bottom. So evidently minus is the bottom in this diagram. Of course, they don't indicate that anywhere, <laughs> which makes it fairly useless. They are keyed in the plastic. If this was a plug and fly, you would not have that glued yet. So gear is going into five. So I'm gonna go here to five. Signal goes up. Signal in our case is the orange. If you, you may find that some of them have a white splitter, uh, a Y splitter. So the white would be your signal. Okay. Sometimes I use forceps for this. It makes it really easy to reach. Okay, flaps are on the last channel. So we're gonna go push this back so you can see a little better. Okay, slip that in. And then the last plug, of course, is going to be for us our ailerons in this case, which is on channel two. Okay, so channel two is right there. Okay, so slide that in and then push it for a good penetration. Good purchase. All right, so I'm going to give this a couple twists. I'm going to go three twists, four twists. That kind of makes it, every twist makes it a little bit closer to the length of the others. Okay, now that I've got those all together, I can just kind of, you could throw a zip tie around it, but I'm actually just gonna try to stuff this down into that cavity. But it's kind of like, you know, a limp noodle. So you gotta be a little bit careful how you do it so you don't yank out any of your connections. Okay, so I'm just kind of tucking that in there gently. And that's gonna get out of our way nicely, if we can do that. Zip tie would probably be warranted here, but I'm just gonna do it this way and see if we have any that come undone during our uh, servo testing. Okay, so that's our throttle wire. So I'm just gonna stuff that down in there to get that out of our hair, because you don't wanna be fighting that when you're out at the flight field. Okay, so that's down now. And I've got one connector that wants to fight us. There we go. So now it's all dropped down in there nicely. Let's see, looks almost like we meant to do it. Okay, great. So now our next step is we got to get the bind plug. Now, since this receiver is a 636B, an AR636B, that means that it's capable of safe select. In this case, it's programmed for safe select. You can also tell from the box, it's going to tell you that this plane has safe select or not. So if you look at the end, oh, there. oh it's on the front too. It's on the front? Where was yeah. it on the front? Under the easy to fly AS3X optional, optional safe, safe select. select. So the reason I talk about safe select is because if you've ever seen our channel before, safe select is something that's been around for a little bit now. And you can choen between AS3X, which is artificial three axis stabilization, 
and that helps with impacts like wind. So like when the wind blows this plane up, but you don't tell it to with the ailerons, then the ailerons are going to resist the movement. So they're going to go up on this side and down on that side to resist that torquing effect. And then same thing with the yaw. If the wind pushes that part of the plane over, then the rudder is going to chase like this and it's going to try to stop it. Same thing with the elevator. If it gets kicked up like this, then it's going to lift to try to resist it. And so what happens is you have a plane that flies very straight, almost like an arrow. The thing that's nice about AS3X that's better than some of the cheaper Chinese alternatives is that AS3X is tuned so that the plane still looks cool flying. It's not like flying like, you know, like just some hyperactive, you know, computerized control system. Now safe sensor aided flight envelope is going to, on the other hand, it's going to use AS3X and auto leveling. So there's a higher level of gain set up on both the elevator and the ailerons to restore the plane to a level attitude, a level attitude. And it's also going to limit your uh, bank angles and pitch angles. Okay. Which is going to help you to not crash quite as easily. I don't fly with safe, but I always bind them with safe so I can show you what it does and how it looks. Um, on the more difficult to fly planes, safe is really nice if you get disoriented because you can turn safe on. And let's say that you're, you're not sure if you're coming or going. Well, you can turn safe on and you have longer for your brain to figure out what's going on. Um, so that's, that's really helpful. If you haven't used it, you bind the plane by plugging in the bind plug and then you plug in the battery and then you press the bind button on your transmitter while powering it on. That's just for regular AS3X only. But to bind it with safe select, you plug in your bind plug, you plug in your battery, then you pull the bind plug out, then you go ahead and press your bind and turn on the transmitter. So just to re go over that twice. Okay. So that's if you want safe select, and then you have to, you have to assign a switch so that it knows when to be on and when to be off. Okay. Which we'll go into all that. We'll actually do it for you. Um, but the two ways are AS3X only without safe select at all. And then there's safe select. So you get to choose that. So if you don't like safe, you don't have to use it. You don't even have to have it on a switch. Okay. But if you have safe select on, it's technically on all the time, unless disabled. Okay. We're going to go into that in more detail. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you, if I haven't mentioned this, look in the description and we timestamp some of the different main events in the video, like the unbox starts at blank, the maiden flight starts at blank, the crashes at whatever, you know, I mean, this, I, we don't always have crashes, but we timestamp some of them if they're entertaining and we have people that want to watch them because some of these videos get to be an hours long. So that being said, also there's millions of questions in the comments. I try to reply to most of them. Um, so without further ado, we're actually done with the build, but I have three extra screws. Hmm. Looks like they gave us one extra screw for the tail. We have one extra screw for the nose cone spinner, and then we have one extra screw for the wings. That was nice. All right, next up, we're going to do radio setup. The radio setup is going to be new and exciting on the NX6 which is new to us and it's going to be new to a lot of you because it's a brand new release as of about two weeks ago. And uh, so we're excited to share that. This build went super smooth. Like how quick was that? Well, I mean, the video is only 43 minutes, so that's figured, short for us. And you could probably do it in half the time you could or do it less. In, you could do it in 15 minutes of if whatever you were it filming. takes us to easily. Film it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep, so sure. beautiful plane. We'll be right back with the radio setup. All right, YouTube. So we're back on the P51 Mustang 1.2 meter and we've got this new NX6 and I want to talk about batteries as they're beeping at me. So when these chargers are done, they beep like that. You can set them to keep beeping and you just press the button to acknowledge when they go blue and then they'll stop. Then over here, this one is, looks like it's about ready to beep. So we'll just let you listen to that. This one is done by a few seconds. So you can click that screen. See how it's doing this like 0 0.4, 0 0.5. It's kind of getting some balance things worked out. This one's still charging the fast charge. So real quick, um, we are going to need a battery. So this one was actually the first one to complete. So we'll go ahead and unplug that. And our 
Transmitter's charging. I don't know if you can wake up the screen to see if it's charged or not, or if I just need to unplug it from the USB plug and then maybe plug it back in. Oh, cool, look at that. Mm -hmm. I'd say that's probably good enough to get the job done. Wouldn't you? For setup purposes. Yeah. Yeah. We're not gonna so be I'm gonna unplug this. Now we have the bigger battery in this too. If you guys haven't seen it yet, I'm not sure how we're gonna organize the video, but we did an unboxing of the P51 and we also did an unboxing of the NX6. This is a new product line uh, that's gonna be offered. The NX line is gonna come in and DX, uh, excuse me, NX6, NX8, and NX10, as well as the complimentary IX20 and IX12. So 20 being the highest level transmitter, which I'm still working to try to get one of those sent. <laughs> I've been unsuccessful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, real quick, uh, the build on this P51 went about as smooth as it can go. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is going to be really similar to setting up the DX18. So we're going to turn this thing on. Okay, it comes on. Okay, we've got uh, switches. I want my switches to all be in the normal standard. I always have my throttle cut switch. This is normally where I would assign my throttle cut. Okay. So in this case, I need to uh, get to the page that shows the setup. I'm just gonna pretend like it's a DX18 and we'll see if the setup configuration is the same. Technically on the Gen 3 models, um, you would just follow whichever one you're doing. This is a DX6i, this is a DX6. So this would be like an older version and this would be like the newer version. So I think I am just gonna follow this, okay? Now, that being said, if I get a control surface backward, don't be surprised because this was not released when this P51 was released, okay? You may be able to get an updated manual, but I kind of doubt it. Just figure it out. It's gonna be like one servo that needs reversed or whatever. So that being said, uh, we're gonna try this right now and see how things go. So we have it in an acro. I'm gonna click. I'm gonna scroll down to system setup. I'm gonna confirm, shut off the radio system, model select, click, acro, add new mod. This is really cool, it's so easy to see. And it really is, even if it doesn't show up on camera, just yeah. because of the lighting, it's... The yeah. lighting is tough on these things, so. Okay, so model select, it's an acro, I'm gonna hit back, model type, I wanna select that. By the way, if you guys have never explored the sailplane feature, on the Spectrum radios, you're missing one of the most powerful tools on this transmitter. And I've only done it once. <laughs> it's <laughs> extremely powerful. I mean, do you think the wing setups are complicated and the acros? Go look at the sailplane just for grins and giggles. Okay, data will be reset, that's what we want. Yes, model name. Okay, so I'm gonna actually show you the scroll on this one. Um, okay, so this name is gonna be P51 Mustang. So in this case, you can see as we scroll, you can highlight the number, you can highlight the colon, you can highlight the space, and so on and so forth. So I'm gonna keep the one colon space, and I'm just gonna scroll. I think I went the wrong way. Sorry, guys. Click. Uh, it's, a, it's a dash. P. 50, whoops, click. Once the cursor highlights, then you can jump in there and start working it. This is really easy, it's a little bit faster, it's not that much different. And that's something I spoke to earlier, and you guys might not have seen it, but there's not a huge change in the way that this works, which made me smile, because I'm not a big fan of change. Nope, you forgot your S. Oh, dang it. Ah. One point two meter. I always do the one point two meter because you guys, if you're anything like me, you're gonna end up with a few different sizes of each of your planes. I went the wrong way. It's all right, still getting used to the transmitter. 1.2 meter. Whoa, that was a lot of noises. Let's see what happens when you go back in. 
So that must mean it's like writing to memory or something. Hmm. I don't know. Aircraft type, normal, normal. Okay, so now we can go back to our radio setup page, which is gonna be right here, computerized transmitter setup. So select airplane, one aileron, one flap. So normal, we'll switch to one aileron, one flap, and that speaks to one control channel and one control channel, as opposed to two control channels and one control channel. Those are the four methods. So it's all the same as before, okay? And then normal, so let's go next. Ooh, I'm curious to see what we've got for pictures now. I know they have a P51 in here. Oh, this doesn't have a camera, does it? Okay. I know on the iX series they have cameras and you can take a picture of your, hmm. which is pretty cool. Previous, back. Okay, so we've set that. So now we need to go to, looks like we're gonna go to function list, which is function list, if you don't know, is when you click, that's the function list. So from regular flight mode with the RF on, you click and that's your function list. Oh, you know what else? This NX6 did not come with a lanyard. Did you notice that? I did notice that. So not a big deal for me. Um, if you don't have a lanyard, you can order the lanyards from the website. But if you get into the higher level, they come with more of those goodies. So this is supposed to be get you into the technology without getting you into the highest price. So they're going to take some of that stuff out of there, which is a bummer. But anyway. All right. So dual rates and expo. Do they talk about that on this last page? Let me go back. So they talk about this. I'm just gonna show you what I do for dual rates and expo to start. I always make an assignment. I click the switch and I assign it to switch F in this case for each. I'm just gonna do this a little bit different today just cause I wanna make sure I get it all right. Okay, so rudder, this is the lowest setting of expo. So it's gonna have the highest, most propensity to be hard to control. This is gonna be where I expect to fly. And then this is gonna be a lot. So this is gonna be the most dampened control, okay? See how that line gets a little bit less steep? So as I move, you see what's happening? It shows you this arrow here and it says, you're giving me 62% output and I'm giving you 49% out. You're giving me 49 and I'm giving you 35. You're giving me 29 and I'm giving you, you're, you're giving me 30 and, you're, and I'm giving you 20. I'm giving you zero and I'm giving you zero. You're giving me nine, eight, and you're giving me five. Do you understand what that works? So it's telling you what the chart output differential is, okay? You can also tell because you can change the expo in either direction too. So there are times when that's handy, like for instance on the elevator, if you never do inverted flying, you can change your expo to be a little bit more responsive on one direction versus the other, okay? So now let's go, and let's talk about this for just one second. So this is curve zero, this is curve one and curve two, okay? So position zero, position one, position two. Okay, see how that works? So at the beginning, we have full output, which is the rate, meaning if you pull the stick all the way to the left, the rudder's gonna move as far as it's set to move, okay? But then in the middle of the stick, there's 5%. I don't wanna call it dead space, but at zero, it's zero. At 95%, excuse me, at 5% over, the change goes back to normal, to full output. But from zero to, to the first 5%, it's gonna give you nothing all the way up to the full 5%. So it's a very small amount of cushion in the middle. So now on my middle step, this is gonna be dampened to the expected level when I first take off. And then if it's not enough, I can go more, or if it's too much, I can go less. You understand? Mm -hmm. So this is where I expect the fly to start. So, from zero to 10%, there's gonna be no output to catched up to regular output. So at 10% of output, meaning you're barely moving the stick over, there's gonna be 
nothing to regular. So now if I set that to 50%, between zero and 50%, you would be caught up fully at the 50%. Does that make sense? It's hard to explain. That's why you just need to fly a plane and see how it feels. Which is weird because you don't have any feedback here, but you swear you do in your brain. All right, so the most dampened, the least dampened. I do the same thing on all three axes. So rudder, elevator. So on, on elevator, I'm gonna start with like, um, let's do five. Then we'll do 15, and then we'll do 30. And we'll drop the rate down to 90 on the most dampened control, okay? This is where I expect to fly, and this is just, you know, I need full control, okay? And then we're gonna go to ailerons. And you're like, but Brian, I have flaps too. How come there's no X? Well, first of all, you don't use Expo on flaps because flaps are generally a switch controlled and they're not necessarily a primary flight control surface. And same thing with retracts or with, you know, like bomb drops or things like this, these other features that you may use. You only use Expo on the primary flight control surfaces which are gonna be your pitch control, your yaw control, and your roll control. And then you build from there. So like if you wanna tie something to the flaps, like you want the flaps to be tied to the elevator, well then your elevator is already expoed, and then the tie to your flaps is responding based on those outputs, okay? And you can turn that on or you can turn that off. So you can have it run directly to the stick position or you can run it to the Expode output, and that's in the mix menu. Most people don't worry about it because it's such a minor difference. Okay, anyway. All right, so ailerons. The first setting I'm gonna set to 10%, then the second setting I'm gonna set to like 20, and then the third setting I'm gonna set to 30. And I'm gonna drop the rate back down to 90. I don't like using rates compared to Expo because rates limit your maximum output control, okay? So if this is 100% down, okay, and this is 100% up on your ailerons, and this is zero, okay? So you're gonna run, if you limit your rates, let's say you run 60% rates, well, you're never gonna be able to go more than 60% on that setting without flipping that switch. Once you flip that switch, let's say you get it set to 100%, you go from 60, then all of a sudden to 100, so what happens is suppose you're flying forward at like 30 miles an hour and there's a tree in front of you and you, you know, for whatever reason you're distracted, you didn't notice it, whatever. Trust me, when you start flying, you'll get it. You want to be able to quickly get away and maybe you don't care how sweet the plane looks. Expo and dual rates are gonna allow you to make the plane more flyable. So maybe you could more easily avoid the tree. But the thing is I wanna be able to yank that stick all the way to the side and make an evasive maneuver. Say it's another plane coming at you, okay? You wanna be able to evade the plane. You don't care how cool it looks. You just wanna be able to get moving now. So if, if you use 50% Expo, which is a lot, um, by the way, the AS3X gets a little bit freaked out if you go too high on Expo, so don't go like crazy, like 70, 80% Expo is never gonna happen on a Spectrum setup or you're gonna cause problems for yourself. It's gonna fly weird. Um, on some of the other brands, like the Jumpers of the world, the Open TX, the, the, the Futabas, I don't know if they have that same problem, but Spectrum doesn't like going over 50%. So say you do 30%. Well, that means that you still have the benefits of having less output, but you can still hold that stick all the way and it's gonna go all the way, okay? It's just the middle of the stick that gets dampened. So it's really easy, it's user-friendly. It helps make up, especially on throttle, the throttle is on, on mode two, throttle, rudder, ailerons, elevator, okay? So on mode two, speaking to mode two, mode one's different, mode four is different, mode three is different, so I'm not speaking to those, just pretend like you're flying on mode two. When you move the throttle stick up, especially if you're using thumbs, it's possible that some people will kind of tend to have a little bit of a propensity to want to move that stick as they move through the range. It's very hard to move it straight up and down, Okay, which by the way, this one feels really easy to do that with, which is nice. They must have a lot of pressure on the side there, which is good. Um, my point is the Expo will help with some of that. So like if you know for sure you're gonna struggle to really keep that stick straight as you move the throttle through the range, give yourself 15% Expo. You're not gonna hurt anything. And then as you move through the range, it's gonna sort of ignore a little bit of that to a degree. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. 
So we've set up the expo. I talk about expo once in a while, but I try not to get so elaborate on it because it takes time to explain something that's very ambiguous. Just fly it and, and adjust it. It's very personal. It is too. very subjective. Okay, so now let's talk about throttle cut. Throttle cut, it's set to inhibit, meaning it's off. I'm gonna click and then I'm gonna move the switch so it's on switch H. So now throttle goes up, oh, minus 100 by default, that's nice. Now it's on and you'll notice it went to minus 100. It's off, it went to 97. Now it's at minus 96, that's a little bit weird. It should be 100 and 100, but whatever. Now it's on, doesn't matter what stick it's in what stick position it's in. Let's turn this off and show you a trick. Okay, so it's fully off. Sticks in a dangerous condition. Still gonna warn you even though you have a throttle cut on. Did you see yeah. how that worked, guys? Mm -hmm. So that's important for you to understand that even though you have a throttle cut on, it's still going to warn you if you have your throttle stick up. Make a habit of having your, your left stick down at the bottom when you shut your transmitter off. And I even have wrapped the lanyard around it when I was new. That might get you into a dangerous situation too because you can yank the lanyard on accident. So just do what's safe for you, okay? Okay, now let's talk about timers. They're suggesting a five minute flight timer based on what battery? They're basing that on a 2200 3S. Now this plane is fully capable of three or four S. That was something that Horizon came out and mentioned and said verbally on some of their, their videos. On four S it screams, on three S it's plenty good, okay? So that being said, we'll fly it on three S because that's what the manual calls out and then we'll fly it on four S as well. Now, originally when these were uh, branded under the Blondie library, they were saying they were only capable of 3S. I upgraded mine with a bigger ESC, but I didn't have to do that. I could have put it on 4S, so we're doing fine. So five minutes. So it says five minutes. When you move the stick up, it starts counting down. And then when you get below 25%, you see it says the percentage there. See how it stops counting? And then when you get back over 25%, it starts counting again, okay? That's not a one out configuration, that's standard. So to click, Go into the function list, scroll down, timer, click again, and now it says five minutes, one out is inhibited. I'm gonna turn that on. So now, when I go over 25%, it's gonna start counting and watch what happens. It keeps counting, okay? The reason you would use a non one out setup, which I feel like it should be one out by default, mm -hmm. then like a sailplane, you give it some throttle, you launch the plane, and you cut the throttle, and the vast majority of your power is gonna be consumed through the motor. So when you cut your throttle, I mean, obviously the electronics, the servos, the stabilizer, the transmitter, receiver, um, because there is transmitter and receiver on that thing. It transmits telemetry and receives signal, makes decisions and transmits back and receives. So there's actually full duplex. Um, the same is not true for all receivers, by the way, but there is telemetry on this. So speaking of telemetry, so on a sailplane, you don't really care when you chop the throttle, you may want to fly around for an hour, you know, and you can do that on some sailplane. But on a plane like this, you're going to be under throttle if you're flying. You might come by and do a glide, you know, for, for cool effect, but you're basically going to be under power most of the time, okay? So use the one out. So now what happens when the, when the timer stops? Well, there's going to be an alarm, but you have to set that up, okay? So it's a countdown style. You can count... You can do a stopwatch. You can just tell how, fly, how far, how long you've been flying. That's good for uh, uh, sailplanes too. And then you can inhibit it altogether. Okay. Oh, it stopped beeping. Did you notice? Hmm. That's where it's beeping from. The 25%. Yep. Yep. So I'm gonna go to countdown. I'm gonna set it to five as suggested. Throttle stick is gonna start it. And you can use other buttons to start it if you want. You can make the function button start that or whatever. You click and then you just, oh, maybe not. Oh, you just, you move this to, to actually set it up. Okay. Yep, 
Yeah, you can't switch it. You have to. And then when you see a box like this, what that's telling you is that with it in the condition one or condition two, see how it's got the little thing that moves across the black thing? That means in position one or two, it's gonna be on. You can go and highlight the one you want to make it turn on with. So in position zero, it's gonna start it. In position one and two, it's gonna unstart it. But why the heck would we ever do that? We're just gonna go to switch C and we're gonna use throttle over 25% because that's the default. Now next is gonna be the clear is gonna allow you to clear the timer, which is on. You can also turn that off or you can change that to a different function, okay? Now, right now it's gonna warn us at one minute, or no, it's gonna give us a tone. You can also go to voice, so it'll talk to you. I'm gonna do a tone at one minute, at 20 seconds, I'm gonna inhibit, at 10 seconds, I'm gonna inhibit, 10 seconds to one second, I'm gonna do a voice. Expiration is gonna to be tone and vibrate and voice and vibrate, oh, okay. And then every minute thereafter, I'm gonna go voice. That's pretty cool. That's nice, yeah. yeah. And then start timer is a tone, stop timer, oh, listen. There you go. Nice, <laughs> okay. We were trying to figure out in the uh, original video, we thought it was a center uh, a center of the stick beep. Because mm -hmm. some people like to have a beep when they're in the center of the sticks. I don't know why. Um, I could think of some applications, but I'm not gonna bother you with that. So but it the was timer, inhibited, so we couldn't figure out yeah, why it was. Yeah, it was inhibited. It was. So the, the, the tone is gonna be voice. Now watch this. So let's walk back. Clear the timer. Time will start. Okay, we'll turn it way up. Get the restart. Clear. Timer start. Timer start. So we'll have that loud and obnoxious so that you people can probably hear that through our lapel mics. Um, yeah, so this thing's ready to bind. So now we're still gonna have to do the uh, safe select designation which hopefully will be pretty easy because like I said, this is a DX, they're an X6. Sorry, I'm gonna apologize in advance. DX is just embedded in my brain because I've been talking about DXs for so long. So the NX will take me a little bit to get used to, just like the IC3 connector versus the EC3 connectors. So throttle cut is on, okay? Go over to monitor mode, verify. It's working, it is. All right, so now we can get ready to bind this. We're gonna bind this with safe select. So in order to bind this, now you'll notice I don't have a little piece of tape here. That was one thing I did on my first one and it worked really nicely. Um, I'm gonna do it right now. This is a trick you certainly don't have to do, but I found it to be very helpful for many, 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 many hundreds of canopy removals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got that little ripped end, so I'll just stick that down here. I'm gonna actually cut that piece of tape off because it's gonna interfere with my ability to get a good bond on, on this. Okay, so we're gonna cut that. We're gonna just slap this down here, try to get it centered. Oh, it's wanting to pull the tape up. Okay, so once that's taped, once that's taped down, centered-ish, now I can Double this back. Okay. And you're probably thinking, oh, that's so ugly. Are you kidding me? You're never gonna see never that gonna thing. You're never gonna see it after today. You're never gonna see it. But when you go to take the canopy off, you can grab that. It's, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it adds up because there's little steps like that really do help. Yep. Okay, so pull the canopy up. Don't forget this is big enough if you're uh, wanting to cross your T's and dot your I's, you gotta do your FAA registration number uh, for the drone registry. Now the battery on this plane is super easy to load. You pull out your tray. This is the 4S, so we'll actually use a 3S. Just because technically it calls out a 3S, 
So we'll use the 3S first. This is up and these smart packs are so much smaller. Mm -hmm. Used to have a hard time putting the 4S's in here, but there's plenty of room if you're using these ones. Looks like my ESC might be lifted, okay. So I'm just gonna strap it in there straight. These are the better style Velcro. Got plenty of length. See how I'm flipping that over? That takes up this slack because you don't want to get it stuck in this rail, okay? Yeah, they're like way longer than they need to be. Like, I don't even think you could put a battery in that long. So you could actually cut these if you want once you figure out what size batteries you're going to use. I just wish this part was stronger because I feel like it's so easy to that rip. That little tabby part. Yeah, it never seems to hold up. Okay. You see, all I'm doing is I'm just... It'd be nice to be able to stick it all the way down there, but then that gets in the rail, so you can't actually feed it into the plane. Okay. I didn't get very tight, but it doesn't matter. All right, so now, when you go over my left shoulder there, camera crew. So this just slides in here. Super easy, I'm just supporting the nose of the plane, and just slide this back, and it clicks. Did I catch the ESC or something? I felt like that was really kind of fighting me a lot. Yeah, I caught the tip of my ESC. I gotta try to push this ESC down a little bit. I don't know why that one's popped up like that, but. I think it's just in there kind of in a weird angle. There we go. I got it set down there a little better now. Okay, so you've almost got enough room with a smaller pack that you could like set it vertical if you wanted. Then you'd really be able to get it in there super tight. And you kind of rotate my straps like this. There we go. Then I can just put that flat. We'll just do that and see if we can get that tight. Sometimes they get glued on the bottom in some of the different planes, and that's always a pet peeve of mine, but what are you gonna do? Okay, so you just line up the top, slip it in there, and then you can put your finger in there. Sounds bad. Oh, that's all the way in. Okay, great, so it's in. All right, so now the next step is we're gonna plug the bind plug in. Oh, our transmitter's on, so we wanna turn that off. Or go into the bind menu. You go into the bind menu if you wanna leave it on. <laughs> that sounded interesting. Okay, throttle cut's on. Bind plug is keyed. There's two flat spots on this angle and this angle. So I think it has to go this way. I might have that backward though. Nope, that was right. Okay, so it's in. Now listen carefully. Be mindful of your prop. Make sure that if it spins, it's not gonna hit anything and then get yourself in a safe position so it's not gonna hit my elbow if something would go crazy, which it shouldn't. Plug in the smart battery. You'll notice it starts flashing. Now I'm gonna pull this out. Okay, lay that aside. And then I'm gonna try to get this so you guys can see both at the same time while holding the bind switch, we're gonna press and hold this, and you gotta be away from it a little bit, like three meters. Binding, DSMX 22 milliseconds. Nice. Okay, cool. So now, I wanna level it. I wanna level it as quick as possible, but we're gonna reinitiate immediately because I don't want this to be the level, okay? So we'll actually, in our case, we're gonna go back through the binding procedure totally now that we've given you a chance to see that. I don't think the um, level is set at that point, but I just wanna be 100% safe because there's nothing worse than turning safe on and having a plane do this because you tend to lose them. Okay, so I'm just gonna actually bind this again. Bind plugs in. I'll show you with the bind menu. Bind. Put the receiver in binding mode before continuing. RF will be disabled. 
Okay. Oh, that's cool. So it's on. Okay. Hmm. So we're going to plug this in. Now I've unplugged this. It's flashing. I've got it level. Ah, oh, dang it. It already was bound. So it just automatically oh, so started. Just automatically went back. Okay, so we'll see. So I guess in this case, I got to power it off and turn it back on. We'll see if it works. <laughs> nice little glitchy end. Okay, so while holding the bind switch. Binding. DSMX 22 milliseconds. You can let go. Bind complete. Oh, maybe there isn't telemetry on this. I said there was telemetry, but I might be mistaken. Elevator. Oh, shoot, we never set flaps. So we're gonna unplug this. Mm. Okay, so flaps are real easy to set up. Sorry guys, I forgot that. So from the main screen, you're gonna click. Actually, I'm gonna turn the volume down because that's kind of annoying. I'll go back to 50. Into function list, we're gonna go flap system. We're gonna set it to whatever switch you want. I want it on B. And they're calling out 100% for flaps, then zero, then 90. So positive 100%, and we also gotta reverse the gear channel. Okay, and then they're saying nothing for elevator correction. That's really crazy, but who knows? And then we wanna to go to speed and switch that to two seconds. So what that means is that when you flip the switch, you can see it moving. See how that moves from 102. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ha <laughs> ha. That's pretty cool. Okay. So it takes two seconds to go from minus 100 to plus 100. That's what the two seconds means. All right, so now they said that we need to reverse the gear switch, so let's, or gear channel. So go to servo setup, travel, reverse, gear. Okay, it's reversed. Okay, everything is done. What we're gonna do is we will power it on and see if everything goes well. Now on this plane, you're gonna find out that the gear don't deploy automatically. And that's nice because if you have the gear switch on your transmitter in the wrong condition, you won't get burned, okay? Awesome. Okay, so that's up and that's down. I don't really know that I have a particular way that I do that all the time. Okay, so now we can put this onto its wheels, which is really cool. And then we can talk about flaps. Okay, so obviously throttle cut is on and tested. Let's go ahead and make sure it works. Oh yeah, good, good amount of power. That's 18%. This is on 3S, that's gonna be crazy powerful. Okay, so flaps, okay? So you notice it's not working, okay? Now that might be because we have that inhibited when we bound everything but it might also be that we're on the wrong channel. So I'm gonna to go to monitor mode. Okay. Throttle cut is on. Oh, we bound it with safe select too. So we gotta figure out how to do that. Okay, so that's supposed to be on switch D. You see how the flap? Oh, that's the travel. Hmm. I need to go into system setup. I'm gonna go to channel sign and just check.
gear, rudder, elevator, aileron, throttle, inhibit. I'm gonna go back down to flap mode. So it's inhibited. Whoa, what does that do? Did you see that? Oh, you can alternate the color scheme? That's cool. Okay, so let's go back to systems. Ah, dang it, sorry guys. System setup. Channel assign. So one of them should be flaps, right? Yeah, that's right. It sort of disappeared on us, didn't it? Okay, so let's try this. So it can tell that auxiliary two is moving. Wait, in your, in your, it was auxiliary one. Yeah, I know. Sorry, I'm reading your screen. See, now it's gear and gear. Okay, so we're gonna pause it. We'll come back and tell you what we figured out. Hold on. Come here. You see this? I accidentally plugged in one of them backward. See, that's not good. So that's why my flaps weren't working guys. Not because of the transmitter, it's because I screwed up and plugged them in backward just to prove to you that you can do that. So I'm gonna just test this on, I can't remember which channel goes to what, but there we go. So there's one channel, there's another channel. Okay, so it's not set yet. The retracts are unhooked right now because I was just digging them out of the little mess that I made in there. So we're just gonna leave it messy for now so that we can get this set up. So as you can see, the flaps are working fine. So the gear working fine. The rudder's working fine. Oh, see, I have that tied to this channel now. That was one thing I did as part of my testing. See this how it says rudder and it says rudder. Okay, so now I can go back to flap system. So I wanna switch that to B anyway. System setup, yes. Channel assign. See, this is where I'm having trouble because like I can't force it to go it to flaps. So I'm just gonna go to rudder again, and then I'm gonna go to next. And you see how it skips over that? So technically this is a, a six, but it's got a seventh channel. So right now it's got that set to B. So I'm just gonna inhibit that and see if I can go back and then change it. Hmm, okay, so now I gotta figure this out. So guys, I made a mistake. Um, I want to show you what I did. First of all, I plugged in those wires backward, but then when I was doing my setup, I screwed with something and I had no way of unscrewing it up. So I want to show you what I did to fix it, which was pretty simple. Um, I went to system setup. I went to model select and I just made a new, I made a new model. I first, I tried copying it. That didn't work. So I have the acro here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into my model utilities and I'm going to delete the models. Sort model list, valid and delete all models, export as template, sort model list. I think I have to actually go to model select and then I have to select the one I wanna delete. And then I'm going to go into model utilities and delete model. Oh, you can scroll here. So I'm gonna delete the copy and then I go back to delete this one, Del delete that one. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna scroll up to model select, and then I'm gonna select acro, and then I'm gonna go into model name, and I'm gonna rename it. This is one thing that's really nice, is you can change the number. Okay, so we'll pause it, we'll reset the name, everything should be set, and all will be well with the world. Then we can figure out the safe select designation for switches, which this evidently has eight channels, even though it's an NX6. So we'll come back and talk about that in just a sec. 
Okay guys, so we got everything working. Let's show them the flaps working. So take off flaps, landing flaps, elevators up and down, roll, roll, rudder left and right, steerable left and right. But look at the elevator guys. See the elevator? How it's like up like this. The drawing might show that in the manual that you want that to be fairly level. Control surface centering, okay? You don't wanna use your trim to do this because you're gonna run out of trim, but we gotta do this and then we gotta get our safe select set up, okay? So obviously we're up like way too high, so you have to adjust your turn buckle to fix that, which is super easy. Just pop this off. Okay, and then I'm just gonna screw this in a little bit. Probably, I don't know, like three turns or so should get us pretty close. Oh yeah, that was, that was just good guessing. See how much nicer that is? Okay. Uh, see my problem I'm having there, camera crew? Can you tell? Is it not? No, I gotta just... Can you go to my right? Or can you not see from over there because my hand blocks? Oh, it doesn't like see from over there. Okay, so I, I just need to overspin past just a hair. I want that to be square mm. with the control. Yeah, I see what you're saying. The clevis yep. or the linkage or whatever you want to call that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we can check again. Elevator up, elevator down. Doesn't seem like a lot of deflection, but that's fine. We'll figure it out. Okay, so everything is working there. Now, throttle cut is on and tested, okay? Throttle cut is off. Plenty of power, throttle cut's on and tested. Clearing the timer. So now, safe is on. How do you tell if safe is on? See the ailerons? It's trying, it's to, trying to find level. And then look at the elevator. You see the elevator goes up and it stays there until you're level. And then I don't think the rudder does that, but the rudder is just gonna be AS3X. So let me see if I can hold this. Is it focused? Okay. So you guys see this? It's hard to see from that angle. <sighs> Stupid lapel mic makes it impossible. Sorry guys, I'm trying to show you because I can see it move when I move the plane and that's AS3X working. And the AS3X is working on the wings too, but safe is on right now. So that's a problem. You may not want safe on. So now we have to figure out how to make our safe select assignment. So if you look in the manual, this is the two different binding procedures outlined for you. And then they talk about move the stick and then hold this down, all that. So I'm gonna tell you how to do that right now. So in this case, if I go to monitor mode, you can see that when I operate the flaps, auxiliary two is changing, okay? because auxiliary two is evidently tied to this switch, okay? So what we need to do is we need to go to system setup, disconnect the radio, go into channel assign, and you see how, don't change that one. Okay, next, see how it says aux two? It won't let you change aux one, which is kind of weird. So I wanna go back out, and then I wanna scroll down to flap system, and I wanna see if I can switch this to D, because that's what they define in the, in the manual, okay? So now, that's on aux two. See how that's aux two? So really what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna walk into system setup, yes, channel assign. I'm gonna scroll all the way to this and I'm gonna just change this to D, okay? So now I can walk back in and then I'll switch this back to what I wanted which is gonna be B, okay? So now B is running that, and then auxiliary two is gonna be actuated by this, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna now make an assignment for safe on this switch. So sticks down and in, one, two, three, four, five. Six, six seven, eight, nine, ten. Did you see it dance? Yep. Okay, so it undanced. So now, um, in this condition with the switch up on D up, Safe is on, and with it down, or in the middle, it's off. Safe on, safe off. Okay, now, I want safe to
to be off in this condition and on in one of the other conditions. So now I can go back to servo setup. I can go to travel. I can go to reverse and auxiliary two, I will reverse. Okay. So now it's easiest to demonstrate upside down. Safe is off in my normal flying mode and then safe is on or safe is off and safe is off, which is what I want. So when I pick up my transmitter and I go to fly, everything is where I expect it to be. Throttle cuts on and tested. Rudder's working, ailerons are working. Flaps are working, flaps are working. And then of course, retracts are working too. So everything on this plane is ready to fly and it's going to be wonderful to show you that here shortly. The radio setup was a little bit longer than usual today because we're outlining this new NX6. But other than that one glitch where we uh, unassigned flaps on channel six, everything went super smooth. So, and obviously I renamed it and all that good stuff. I'm excited to try this. I, I don't think it's going to be that big of a difference. And it feels like you're getting a really high quality transmitter at a really economical price. And so I'm excited. Plus this display is nice. You can really see it good from angles. Mm -hmm. That's not going to show up good on camera. But Within the thing person, is, yeah. it makes a big difference when you're flying. Sometimes you get at weird angles. Usually you can look down and you can see pretty good, but like you can see really good with your peripheral vision now, which is nice. Mm -hmm. The voice prompts are something that I, I didn't think I'd care about, but having the timer, be able to be spoken to you, that's super nice. I'm excited to try it. The antenna being able to point, I don't know if I care or not yet. We'll find out. And then also CG, before we go any further, we're gonna talk about CG. This plane, in my experience, has been really CG, um, like I didn't think it was a big deal. It, it didn't seem to give me any problems flying, so we're gonna grab the calipers. World's cheapest, crappiest calipers here, and we're going to go ahead and open these up to 85 plus or minus three. Ooh, look at this. Oh, I thought it was loose. Okay, so we're 85 millimeters plus or minus three would be 82. So geez, that's a long ways back. 80, 82 or 88. Okay, from the wing root. And you're going to test this one upside down. Okay, so it's right to the I would say like that first rivet, that's the beginning mark. And then I'm gonna go out to 85, six, seven, eight. Okay, so there's 88 from the wing root. Okay, so there's two little bumps there. And then I'll just do the same thing over here. I'm gonna go out about the same distance. Okay, so there's one mark and then 82. And you're probably thinking, geez, you're gonna, you're gonna do that to your beautiful plane? Yeah, I am. <laughs> Just because I've done this enough times that I know that that's the easiest way to get it done. Yeah. Um, I've done tape with hot glue on there too, and that works really nice actually, because you can almost balance it on the, the bump. But in this case, I can just come in here and just have a little bump. It's very hard to distinguish when flying, but it looks fine. You can definitely feel it. Okay, so I have the gear up. So I'm gonna actually put the pad of my middle finger because it's the longest finger right there. And I'm just gonna feel it. And it is a little bit tail heavy. So the way you adjust your CG on this plane is super easy. If you've got your battery in already, you can just push it forward until you get it to where you're satisfied and then repeat until such a time as the plane is CG'd out. And when I say CG'd out, I mean you want it to be pointing down a little bit or level. I prefer down just a little bit. I think I have that battery all the way forward right now. So on the back holes, it's close, but no cigar still. I'm on the back holes. 
See, it still wants a lot. On the front holes, it's way tail heavy. So let's look at this battery tray for just a second. Okay, so I'm gonna unplug the battery so I can take it out. Oh, EC3 connectors. It can be a pain. So you see how far up I am? I'm gonna try to go further and see if I can even get it to go further. It's about to go up. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I think I might be, I think I might be all the way forward. So the 4S pack might get a CG better. Yeah. So if I've got the battery all the way forward and I'm still not CG'd or I'm not satisfied with my CG, then the next step is gonna be, we're gonna have to basically add a little bit of nose weight, which I'm really not excited about that. So let's try taking these off. They should be about at the center of gravity, but I'm curious to see if that's gonna help. It should a little bit. Oh, except we want them on there. Okay, so that's how you do it. Once you get it leveled out, it's fine. It'll balance and it should be just either level or just slightly to the nose because you want a little bit more nose heavy. Nose heavy planes tend to fly well um, or better and then tail heavy planes fly once. That's what I've always heard and it's fairly true. You get into more advanced planes, you can fly them a little bit tail heavy for longer soaring times. All right, guys, you've already probably seen the flight. You've probably are about ready to see our unbox and first thoughts on the NX6, but this plane is gorgeous. It's gonna fly great. I already know because I've flown it before and I can't wait for you guys to experience it yourself. If you haven't bought one for yourself yet, check the link in the description below. You can obviously pick up your own NX, whether it's a six, an eight, a 10, or if you wanna go crazy and buy an IX series and buy the IX20 or IX12, that'd be great. Thanks for coming. Come back for more. We're gonna jump straight into the unboxing, but I wanna to talk to you about this too. The NX series is a new series of radio transmitters that Horizon's offering. And this is a 3.7 mil, this uh, 3.7 volt 1S. It's a 6,000 milliamp hour uh, LiPo pack that's gonna be used for, or is that a LiPo? It's for the IX12. I don't even, this is, this may not be LiPo. I think it's a lithium ion. This one is lithium ion. Okay, so the discharge rate is slower. And so that's gonna actually go into the transmitter. So the reason I bring this up is because I'm not 100% sure how the charging works on this. So I've been hanging on to this because I wanted to pair it with the P51. And why do I want to pair it with the P51? You're probably thinking to yourself, Brian, that's six channel. You can't use a six channel for that. And yes, that's exactly what I said when I called Horizon. And I was like, what the heck is this? Throttle, elevator, rudder, ailerons, flaps, retracts. How do I turn safe on? Well, there's another channel that's hiding amongst the six that's allowed for safe, select, activation, and deactivation. So if you are trying to keep on budget, you go for the DX or the NX6, and then you can go ahead and still operate a plane that has flaps and retracts as opposed to a plane that just has, that just has, <laughs> that just has flaps or retracts. Um, so this, this will work, which is really nice. Is there another cat in there? Let's just show we the have, people what's going on. We have three of them. <clears throat> we have three cats and there's yep. a cat in the box. There Get is. out of there, you're not part of this unboxing. <laughs> so at any rate, this is the new line, as you know, I am very, very married to my DX18. So, oh, my wife was pointing at herself. <laughs> I mean, camera crew. So I'm, I'm not sure how this is gonna work out. I'm kind of excited to see, cause I feel like the screen might be easier to see when we're filming. Um, I'm also excited to see how it's gonna perform in lower light conditions. We do a lot of twilight flying. So we'll see how this works. Um, we're gonna jump into this unbox right now as well show you what it comes in for packaging. Okay. There's nothing else in there. It's just the regular thin walled, nice, heavy duty. This came in a regular corrugated cardboard box. 
just like what the plane came in. Okay, so this is obviously not, um, you know, like some sort of a, you know, like carry it to the field, although you could, because that actually would protect it. One thing, oh wow, look at that. The antenna folds. Hmm. Huh, that's weird, I didn't know that was gonna do that. The gimbals, they feel really nice. Switches, so there, that'd be where I'd do my flaps. We got a C, a D, an F. There is not a knob over here on a six. Throttle cut for me. Whoa, whoa, hold on. Yeah, there's one up there on mine. You see guys? I've got slider size comparison. The DX18, let's see. Here, come over here to the ion, or yeah, legs that are there. Obviously on the 18, we've got the rubber here and then we got plastic, but there's only a little thin strip of plastic. And then you go back to rubber. <laughs> you guys want rubber on the sides like that because otherwise you're gonna slip. This has very good rubber here. Trainer plug, USB. That looks like a USB micro. Headphone jack, what's a headphone jack for? Like a legit headphone jack? Oh wow, look at that. Oh, so it does come with a lithium, but this is oh. a smaller pack. Okay, so that's a 3.7 volt, 2000 milliamp hour. This one's a uh, 3.7, but this one is a 2,000, I think. Where is 6, it? 6,000 milliamp. Oh, 6,000? Jeez, that's huge. Yeah, so it's 6,000 milliamp hour. So when you want to switch that out, then you just take out this little, that's really sharp the way they did that, actually. I like that a lot. Um, I'm actually just going to do that now, just because I don't want to forget to do it. <laughs> um, connector style. That is a 1S HXT connector. See, this is smart, smart battery. But yeah, so that's a 1H, 1H, 1S HXT connector. I believe that's a Hextronic style. So I mean, hypothetically, you could actually charge that on any of your regular chargers. You have to be able to assign it. See this, guys? Let's just show you how this works. So you plug in the smart charger or the dumb charger, it doesn't really matter. And in this case, uh, this one's a little bit weird to start, but you would just plug this in here. Okay, so you plug it into the 1S plug. Well, that's weird. See, it thinks it's two. <laughs> that's weird. Why does it think it's two? Okay, we're gonna try going to this one. Now, normally I would just charge it in the transmitter, but I just want to see what happens if you can get it to work. We're going to go to the 2100 and just see how it handles it here. Oh, maybe I didn't line up. Here we go. Oh, I know what it is. Look. The polarity is backward. See that? You see that polarity? See how the red is on the left and the black mm -hmm. is on the right? On a regular charger, since it's keyed that way, it would actually be the other way. <laughs> that's, okay, so yeah, so in my case, I don't think that's probably a good idea. Let's not charge it this way, let's just charge it. So now that we've evaluated that, you know not to try that yourself. It didn't hurt anything, but look. So the key goes down. Sorry, I know it's hard to get an angle on that. Okay, so just plop that in. Okay, and then this, was in there like that. It's always tricky to get those wires. Okay, cool. And normally I would, um, when I do something like that, I almost always jump into my bag of goodies and I find one of my bind plugs and I stick a bind plug in here so that when I'm out at the flying field, if I get a buddy who needs to bind, then you can always do that real quick. So we're gonna pause and we'll do that right now. We don't need to show that. Okay, so once you get your little bind plug plugged in there or just stuck in there for storage, I just stick it around the battery. Then the cover, oh, it's got a rail all the way down the side. How do you get that lined up? These are the sort of things that, that's weird. There we go, you gotta slide it all the way up the whole side of it, which is probably good. Okay, so what else do we have here? 
This screen is like really nice. I don't feel like it's gonna scratch as easy. These ones have that recess and this is flat. You feel that? Mm -hmm. Look at this. It, it always yep. gets stuff built up all around it, which is yep. that was always a pain. Plus you're looking down into that cavity. And then this is bigger, the D-ring adapter, which is good. The glare the, is gonna be a lot better. Well, I'm off at least. Oh, this is still protected. Oh, it's still got the protector on it. So if I peel that, don't forget to peel your protection off. Gosh, that's like really hard to get started. Sure. Yeah, I'm 100% sure. I can see it coming. Oh, yeah. I see you see? Yep. It's hard to tell it's on there, which is pretty sweet. Some people will leave that on perpetually. Oh, yeah, that's protection. Yep. I just hope that wasn't a protective film that was supposed to be left on there, but I kind of doubt it. That's pretty thin. So now that looks a lot more like what I was expecting. Okay, then this, this is a button. Oh. Huh, weird. There's no pushes here. Ooh, what's that? Look at that. Oh, that's an opening. I bet that's why they sent, okay, so in this bag, there's a USB, see that? That must be how you make adjustments to your, to your sticks. Hmm. Okay, so let's unwrap this and see what we got. Yeah, USB. It's a nice USB cable, it's not super long. Oh, so I wonder if that's how you charge it. That's what I was just gonna ask. Cause I didn't see a, a charge plug, like on my DX18 I have a charge drum down here. Mm -hmm. That'd be the female drum. So on this one I'm assuming you must Charge it there. Charge jack input DC five volts at approximately two amps, okay? Um, in terms of feel, see that little recess there? And this is a, a little bit deeper recess. Hmm. So if I'm flying, it feels like it's, it's a little bit closer to where your index finger hits, which is good. Is it a lot lighter? Actually, no. I don't like them being super no, I light. Know. I want a little bit more heft. And part of the problem is like when you fly with a lanyard, if it's so light, like, I don't know. It's, it's good to have light for some applications and it's bad to have light for others. I do feel like that antenna, that would be nice because the idea behind the antenna technology is you wanna be perpendicular, you know, cause we have a diversity antenna. So there should be an antenna here, I believe, and then an antenna here. I don't know that for a fact, but I know on the DX18, there's an antenna in the back handle and an antenna in the vertical. So you kind of get your diversity either way. But if you imagine your planes flying along, then you get diversity here and you get diversity here, but you're kind of like running parallel to the mm -hmm. plane. So it's less useful. So if you can, so some people hold their transmitters more up and then some people that fly sailplanes actually build uh, boards that will hang and they have a chest rig that goes around and then it holds it right here and then they can flip all the millions of switches. I don't do that. Okay, so far I like it. Hey, can I have a charging yeah. question? Then a bind, bind button. That's a big bind switch too. Momentary push button. Yeah. Can you plug that USB thing into yeah. one of those? Yeah, the power supplies. Power so supplies. let's try that now. Well. I, I sort of want to turn it on though. Okay, so oh. this is a power button, I guess. Oh, so it's on. Wow, cool. Let's go over here. Wow, that's so nice. It's, okay, I want to try that with the other one. Turn it, okay. I think you should turn it off and turn it back on again so I can see good. Okay. Yeah, it's low, 3.7. Ooh, did you hear that? There's yeah. volume. Okay, so. Let's see how long it takes to turn on. Trying to do, oh shoot, okay. So, pressing. That's way faster. Yeah, it is, that's crazy. The RF just came on, guys. Wow. Did you see how fast that was? That's, that's a huge improvement, really, because when, when you crash a plane, 
because your transmitter gets turned off on accident, you're gonna really appreciate that feature. I have never done it, but my dad did when I was a kid. Um, anyway, old technology. But the thing is like they have this recess, so it's hard to get to it, but it's still mechanical. And look at this, this is still on. See how it's off, still on, still on, still on. See, it's never actually shut off. So that's important. Now, because this is a push button, you have to hold it for a couple seconds, like three, four. Yeah, you gotta hold it for a long time. That's really easy to see. Mm -hmm. I'm really happy with that. Very let's go look at it in the sunlight. Okay, so let's turn it on. It takes for about three seconds to turn, to turn it on. Let's go right out into the belly of the beast. It's, no, actually it's probably brighter right here. Let's go right here in the stairway. Okay, so, uh, all right, so it's shining in my eyes, the reflection of the sun, but look at that. I can see that. Can you? It's yes. It's gonna be really hard on the screen. Oh, well, uh, I there. can see it. Now I can. Yeah. I mean, in person, I can see I mean, see if, you it get, too. if you get to that angle where it's reflecting into your face, then I mean, obviously you can't see because it, gl it glares in your eyes. But that's just a function of a flat screen that's, you know, that's gonna be true among any radio. Um, okay, so. Ooh. Feels nice. It's fast. Okay, so let's let's look at that too. Okay. See with the firmware update on my DX18, you can tell that it's slow. See how it doesn't refresh the screen quite right? Mm -hmm. That's the forward programming was a big thing that went through. Look how fast that is. And it's a lot easier to read with the, I don't know, it's just easier. Oh, the monitor's at the bottom of the screen. See that? All, all the time? You can see that refresh so much faster. Mm -hmm. Hold on, is this? No, it's not a touch screen. Hold on a second. All right, sorry guys, our cats were like meowing like crazy. I guess they wanted out. So when we look at this screen, I noticed it dimmed while I was walking away for a second, but then it wakes up as soon as you move the cursor. On this, it wakes up the backlight as soon as you move the, the scroll bar. So that's pretty good. It's really easy to see what's next because that high contrast helps you to tell that you've highlighted your choice. That's one thing that was maybe not great on the LCD backlight is let's say we're going to the timer. You can kind of tell what's going on here easy, but there's certain times when that change is tough to see, like in mixing. Mm -hmm. Or is it, yeah, mixing's a good example. So like when you go into a mix, there's certain times where there's a square around it and it's sometimes a little bit challenging. Oh, or if you need oh, to I like know. reverse. Uh... Yep, so like this. So like we'll just uh, set up throttle to throttle and let's set it to switch, a three position switch. No, nope, that's two. So there's a three. So it's like, well, what's on and what's off, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit, it's, you figure it out really quick when you get used to playing with this stuff. Now I gotta clear all this junk out. Okay, so we'll shut that off. Not having the sliders is not a big deal. I actually have never used the sliders yet on my DX18 except for one application. Um, oh, audio. Was there audio in there? Audio events. Okay. Switch changes, stepping reports, generic reports, center tones. Okay, so then there's trainer alerts, mode starts, system sounds, system idle, voice and vibrate. Okay, so that's the back key. Oh, look. This was a, a speaker before. This was back and this was clear. Okay, so you have like the close in the back and then FN, so it's like a function button. Doesn't seem to do anything here. VTX setup. I don't know, is that like the my list function bar? Oh, there's the volume. See when you click? Mm. Ooh, that's Whoa. nice. Yeah. Volume 100. Sounds like it doesn't handle it very good. So let's go. So when you hit the back button, then that allows you to get into your volume. Nothing happens there. 
There's the monitor mode, which is way better. It refreshes way faster. Mm -hmm. I hate center tone. It drives me nuts. Let's shut that off right now. Audio events. It does it not say silence? Do you have to go down to alarm? Oh, you know what that is? That's probably a, a timer starting. See this? But it's inhibited, so. See when it says there's 51%, so it is. That's the center tone, but look where it is. I need to calibrate that. Like, it's saying that's center. See where it is? No, you gotta show them right there on the guide or on the gauge. That should be here. But anyway, that's not a big deal. You can calibrate that. Okay, so system setup. System setup. This is gonna give you the same RF warning. Shuts off the RF. Ooh, cool. Center tone. Maybe it was a rudder. I don't know, it says silence. What is that? Is that polite? What is it? I don't know. I don't know, that's probably not something like US. Okay, so transfer SD card. Oh, that's right, let's see. There's an SD card, look, it goes right to the micro now. Instead of a mini, like on my DX18, Let's just show you what, what's going on in this. Mm. It's got a mini instead of a micro. So most people are working with micros anymore because that's what all the smartphones have. So, but I, there's gotta be a lot more onboard memory on this thing. Okay, so dual rates and expo. Let's see what that looks like. Oh, wow, that's a really nice screen. It's so much easier to see where things are. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Okay, so that gives you guys a, a quick review. I mean, it's gonna probably function almost identical to the DX18. And the reason that we wanted to introduce this with a plane is just because then that gives us a chance to work with it. Um, no, I'm not gonna download directly to this from Wi-Fi. Oh, that's the other big feature this thing has. This has Wi-Fi. So let's see if we can find it. And we have, we might have to film this a little bit. So system setup, yes. Telemetry, oh cool. Pre-flight, frame rate, oh cool. Whoa, you can do different frame rates for different servos, that's cool. Maybe you can do that on the DX18 too, but I'm not aware of it. There's Wi-Fi utilities. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to probably pause it for a second just for our security and we're gonna look at this. All right guys, so we're gonna just do this. This is just a little security measure, okay? So select network, Wi-Fi settings. It says twiddling thumbs or thumbs twiddling. And then it comes up with our choices, which is super easy. Okay, so you just pick whichever one you wanna hook up to. So I'm just gonna help you out. This says upstairs, that says downstairs. So you can see the intensity, the gain intensity, and then it's gonna attempt to auto connect. Okay, so give me just a second. Type in my password here. So I'm going to type in my password, which I have to go look up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so I've got my password typed in, which is a little bit weird. When you do type it in, you have to make sure you're all the way to the left because it looks like where the where, where you put the cursor, it looks like you're supposed to line it up under the PW and you just go all the way to the left, which I mean, I should have known better. So anyway, I'm gonna click connect and then I have to cover some things. It just says connecting and it's probably gonna say like connection failed because I'm sure I probably typed in the password wrong. 
but it's gonna, yeah, failed, authentication failure. So give me just a second here. So the other thing too is you have to click on this, you can show the screen. So this says inhibit for auto connect and then you can go to active. Active is gonna turn on the automatic connect. So every time you come in and out of your house or you come into range, then it's gonna auto connect and then do things, you can do things like update your firmware and all that stuff. I believe you can also download models directly to the transmitter, which is really nice. Because to be honest with you, yeah, you could do it with the DX18 and the old uh, generation models. I think this is a Gen 2, Gen 1, this is Gen 1. So they're up to Gen 4 on a lot of the DX line. So anyway, this is gonna be so much easier. So the direct Wi-Fi connection, I'm gonna work through getting this Wi-Fi hooked up. It should take me just a couple of minutes. I'm sure I typed in my password wrong. But once we get that done, and remember, Wi-Fi, that's your responsibility. You gotta make sure your Wi-Fi works with your Wi-Fi equipment. So when I get it figured out, I'll let you know what I did wrong and we'll come right back. It's just too hard with network security stuff. I don't wanna be putting this online with you know passwords and things like that. So we'll come right back. Okay, so guys, I'm gonna type in a fake password just because this is a weird step. I did figure out my problem. I had typed in the wrong password. So the first thing too is when you do type in a password, the password basically, it shows up as, as asterisks. Well, it's like decimals or whatever periods. But um, in this case, so let's say your password was, um, see what I did? I moved from there to there. You gotta be all the way to the left. And let's just say it's like password. So, which it's not password, guys. So PA, why did I pick such a long password? Just Let's say yeah. it's pass, okay? So when you're done, you go, you scroll all the way over and you go to back. So it's a little bit ambiguous exactly what to do. Then you hit back and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna go to auto connect if you wanna auto connect and then you hit connect. So now it's gonna try to connect, whatever, you've already figured out the, they've already figured it out. <laughs> it's all right. Please don't hack me. Chinese. All right. Our internet's crappy. You don't want to. Failure. Authentication failure. Okay. So now I'm going to go put in the correct password and I'll enter it and then it, you don't see it while we're connecting. So we'll show you that. Okay. All right. So we've got it ready to connect. And so, and by the way, I should warn you guys, the saturation on the camera on our smartphone that we film with sometimes gets a little bit goofed up with these colors compared to the dark backdrop. So don't hold that against the transmitter because this is really easy to see. Okay. okay, so then scroll down to connect and then it basically says connecting and it's gonna say authentic obtaining IP address and then it's done, okay? So now this little light comes on and so you're connected to the Wi-Fi. So that looked a lot harder than it should have been because I was trying to use my passing credentials for my password correct credentials to log in and change the configuration of the Wi-Fi setup. So that was my bad. Okay, so now it gives you options. I'm just gonna read these to you. Login, register, deregister, check for updates, and so on and so forth. Erase credentials, that's important. So like if you ever sell your transmitter to somebody else, um, then you need to erase your credentials. Otherwise, when they go to log in, they're gonna have to use your credentials for your Horizon Hobby account in order to actually be able to um, connect. So like if somebody gives you one, like I had somebody at one point had given me a DX9. I probably need to call this guy, Tom, and say, hey, Tom, can you de-connect uh, your serial number from the Horizon Hobby account that you have? So if you ever update the firmware, you need to be aware of that. So like if somebody steals your transmitter, then I believe there might be some remedial actions that can be taken. But anyway, I, I don't even want to get into that. I just want you guys to understand that, that this is, this is going to get into the user level of things. And I don't want to review all that because it's like very personal for everybody. Um, so I'm going to work on trying to get my credentials set up in here and then we'll come right back. It's, I don't know, it's probably going to, what are we like 25 minutes into the video? Half an hour. Half an hour. So if we got a half an hour in it, still trying to like demonstrate all this stuff and showing you where the switches and things are. I mean, you could have this thing out of the package and you could be on your Wi-Fi in like five minutes, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm really impressed. Usually it takes me a lot longer to get Wi-Fi stuff to work. Um, and the other thing is the auto connect is gonna be really nice. Now you can set up multiple auto connects too, I believe. So if you have like a, a Wi-Fi at your house and you have a Wi-Fi at your shop and you have a Wi-Fi in your truck and you have a Wi-Fi at your you know girlfriend's house and you have a Wi-Fi at your gr other girlfriend's house, then you can set those all up. Just don't, you know, unless your girlfriend uses your transmitter. 
so <laughs> she might notice that. <laughs> okay, we'll come right back. So one thing to keep in mind, when you're logging in, there's a login step. Don't get your credentials confused between the horizonhobby.com and your spectrumrc.com. I did that, and so when I went to log in, I had used my you know, full domain name and everything, and the username on Spectrum is, is different. So, I mean, you may have, I don't think you can have the same as on Horizon Hobby, because Horizon Hobby is like an email address, and then Spectrum is a username. So if you're trying to log in and you're having trouble and it gives you this error, it says username or password incorrect, check there. That's the first thing you should check because that's what I was doing wrong. I tried that like three times and I thought maybe it's something about the way I'm typing it in that's screwed up. Um, but I'm just gonna not show you the screen until I, I try this. Once you log in, then it gives you a chance to register, deregister, check for updates, log out and erase credentials. So of course, erase credentials is like when you sell it. Um, you do not have to log in to erase the credentials, just so you know, like you can highlight that and do that at any time. Um, also, I have my Wi-Fi auto connected. So I'm just kind of curious, like if I were to take this with me, shut it off and drive away to the flight field and turn it on, I don't know if the Wi-Fi is gonna, you know, try to reconnect all the time. I, you can shut that auto connect back off. So I'm gonna go in here and just click register and see what happens. It says twiddling thumbs, it gives you a loading screen so it looks the same. And if something exciting happens, I'll let you know. Okay, so it just goes back to the regular screen. It's not really anything too exciting. It must have registered to my name. And then uh, check for updates. I'm gonna click, it says uh, thumbs twiddling. And um, okay, so it's giving me a chance to check for updates. This is at 3.0. It's recommending that I go to 3.02.01, okay? So I'm clicking and it's updating. I mean, that's gonna be like the easiest firmware update I've ever done in my life. Um, okay, so it says 0% done. It's saying 2% download, four, five. You can show them this. Now this is just gonna be relative to the, um, the speed of transmission for your, your Wi-Fi and the speed of transmission for your internet. Because at this point, of course, you're demanding that the internet and your Wi-Fi work together. This is not hosted on your local machine. It's hosted over there at, at uh, Spectrum RC's server. So this, this is gonna update the firmware. I recommend on any new technology like this or the iX series, always keep your firmware up to date. There is, should be a no brainer. I mean, you should really do that on the old stuff too, but to be perfectly honest on the old stuff, if it's working for you, from an industrial perspective, when I work on industrial systems, if you don't have a problem, there are many that are of the mindset that if it's working, don't fix it. Because sometimes when you fix it, you'll create new complications. Um, and I have heard occasional grumblings that Spectrum has like radio connection issues and things like this. I've never had that happen in our whole time. Except tracks the Stabilization Plus, which was the stabilizer with auto leveling that I actually never got to work, um, which is funny because I use the Lemon RX a ton and Spectrum's not a big fan of it, but I don't care. It's, I was, it was awesome. It's like one of my favorite off-brand choices. Oh, so now it's got a file name that's downloaded. I'm gonna wake up the screen and it just says uh, zero colon. So this shows like the uh, directory and it's a .sax file. So I'm just gonna click install. So then it goes to another screen and it's kind of a weird reverse status screen. It says Spectrum, it's really pretty. Oh, so now it's, okay, so it must be rebooting. And this is, this is like the Windows style status bar. So like they kind of go like backward, then forward, then backward, then forward, then forward, then backward. Then lots of, like lots of status bars. Like, whoa, wow, it was a 14th status bar that didn't go through tech support. Like seriously, can I just, can I just ask the developer something? Like, why do we have status bars? What is the point of a status bar that moves completely from the right to the left? And then why does it go back to the right? Is this like, is this like a challenge? Like a tug of war? I don't understand. You need a status bar for your status bars to see how many status bars. Are well, the left. thing I don't understand is like, why don't we just have one status bar that says, you know, like zero percent, one hundred percent. That's a good idea. I don't know. I, I like mean, it. 
I've been working on computers for many, many moons. So, and I, yes, I am cleaning my screen. It's brand new and I'm cleaning it. You're thinking, why are you cleaning it, Brian? Well, because I've been screwing with it and I spit on it a lot. <laughs> this is, this is, there's millions of people watching this. You can't laugh about that, camera crew. This is important stuff. Oh, look, now it's on. So now it says version or 3.7 volts. <laughs> I thought that was a version. Wow, the timer's still going. That's weird. Okay. Looks like everything is still working. You have a bad glare in here. Here, how about that? Okay. So evidently they didn't change that. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, the moral of the story is now that we have the transmitter completely updated, uh, we have our Wi-Fi credentials set up, um, interestingly enough, my Wi-Fi blue light is not on, so I'm curious if I have to go reset that for some reason. Let me just check this before I go on screen with it. I'm going to system setup. The RF will be disabled. Yes, it shuts off the little RF light. And then I scroll down to Wi-Fi utilities, connect to network, thumb twiddling, loading. It did change the screens here a little bit. It's connecting to something obtaining an IP address and then the blue is on. So now it says connected. Um, so I don't know, maybe, so now I can just go back. Ooh, see it shut off. I think it might've turned off my auto credentials, like, or not my auto, but my auto connect. Hmm. So now it says connecting. Now it says obtaining IP address. It says connected. So that's kind of weird. So I wonder if they changed that because login is not even a choice now. Register, deregister. I'm gonna see what happens when I hit register. It's probably gonna say like error because you've already registered your device. Mm. Yeah, it says serial number already registered. Okay, so it says um, SPMRC error is 3008, serial number already registered, okay? So then you have to hit the back button. It just kind of like locks the screen until you hit back. Uh, check for updates. I'm going to just check for updates again. Just see what happens when you have like the most latest and greatest uh, firmware. Uh, it says installed. So it shows that it's installed. So 3.2.1 is installed. And then I could log out or I could erase credentials. I'm going to hit back. Oh, there we go. There's a connect to network and save networks. So just give me a sec. I'm going to look at my save networks. Okay. So save networks. Okay. I see that they're saved. I'm gonna to connect to network and it's checking, it's selecting. So now it's doing the thumb twiddling. Um, and then there's a splash screen that happens. I think what's happening is it's not allowing me to connect to something else because there's already one that's connecting. That's a little bit weird. I wonder if that's a glitch. So that being said, I don't see a way to roll back to an older firmware version. So I don't really care because it's working otherwise. But if I didn't have access to my Wi-Fi, I'm not sure how that would work. I think the way you do it now is you go into the system setup, you shut off your RF, you run down to Wi-Fi utilities, and then you go into your saved networks. And then you can, you can see. My problem is if I want to connect the new network, if I select the network, it seems to be skipping past that screen. So I don't have an opportunity to find another network because it connected to that one. So as a result, it doesn't allow me to find a different network. So I don't know. That's kind of weird. All right. We're going to come back in a minute. I think we're probably, would you say that we have thoroughly beat this horse to dead status? Mm -hmm. I'm excited because it fits my hand nicely. It does everything that I wanted it to do for setup. It feels good in the hand which is just one of the things that I like about Spectrum is that you just get it and it works. Um, the switches are all reachable. There's definitely less of them because this isn't a DX18. The screen is very readable. That was my biggest concern was that this thing was gonna wash bad in the sunlight. Um, there's also a timeout on the uh, backlight. I'm gonna see if I can turn that so that it's like just never shuts off. In fact, let's check that right now. That'd be one thing that people might wanna do. So let's go to system setup, disconnect the art. Here we got a glare. Mm, I'm pretty good. 
Okay. So I'm going to go to... Brightness. 30 seconds. On. Yeah, buddy. Oh, cool. Wow. So like for us, we would want to... And we're also closing the blinds, in case you guys were wondering. So you can set that wherever you want. It's a lithium ion battery. And then the activity alarm is 10 minutes. So for us, we might want to put that to like 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to scroll off screen for just a second. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can change the mode right here. Look how quick and easy this is. The mode. Wait, hold on. Okay, show them. Yep. One, two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. So I want it on mode two. Okay, now scroll away just in case. <laughs> Next. It shows the box styles, the channel monitor is, you can do six, four, or default. I'm gonna put it to six. So like if you knew you were only using a four channel plane, you could make it monitor only four channels. I don't know why you would ever wanna do that. There is a factory reset. Oh, so this is how you calibrate. So if you scroll all the way to the right, there's been nothing compromising okay. there. Okay, so cycle sticks. Hold on. So you go all the way to the outside edge. This should center those sticks for us. Okay, and then you want to center all your switches. Oh, I got to get to the center. I'm sorry, not the, not these, not the switches, guys. Sorry, I had to do that on an older one. So the vibrate setting is low. I want to turn that up. Did you see the happy noise that happened when I did that? <laughs> okay, so we're gonna go back into system setup. The RF will be disabled. And then I wanna go back into system setup. Okay, so you can see there, ooh, vibrator. Whoa. Listen. It's not walking. Mm -hmm. It's not walking, guys. Okay, so the vibrator is a little bit less intense. So if that's why you're getting this, you know, you might want to go for a different one. <laughs> um, the vibrator on the DX18 is strong enough that it will like <laughs> into a million pieces. So th this is probably a good update. <laughs> so anyway, um, the throttle stick warning, let's just turn this off. That's an automatic warning. Okay, cool. One, two. So it takes two seconds. That's weird. No, it's not. That's good. Now, the other thing too, guys, is as you know, when you program an ESC, I don't know if you could tell on that, but the, um, the throttle position was at 68% because I could tell from looking at the screen on the monitor, which is on the bottom. So that's really nice. They show the monitor to indicate that there's a problem. But the other thing too is with the stick all the way up, you need to have the throttle at 100% to get into the programming mode of your ESC. So on, on like a legacy ESC, you, you hold the throttle all the way up, you turn on your transmitter, you have it on, and then you plug in your power and you're like, oh, what do you want to cut your hand off? No, you do that on purpose. And then that forces the ESC into programming mode and then it starts chiming at you. And it usually has a series of beeps and like, you know, each step is like one beep. And then you move the stick down to go into that menu structure. And then you move the stick back up to make the change. And then you move it down to skip to the next setting and you just follow those beeps. So you need that functionality. It'd be nice to be able to prevent that throttle from working when you turn it on in an up condition. But that's also important because if you're flying and you have a disconnection or the radio shuts off or you accidentally turn off the radio, you get your lanyard resting funny on it, which I was a little bit nervous about that, but this thing seems like it's gonna be pretty safe from where the lanyard hangs. So anytime you have a push button, you want it to be very protected against accidental bumps, okay? So I've covered a lot on this. I mean, this is, this is pretty exciting. I mean, you know why I'm really excited about this, guys? Because it didn't change that much. It just, they added features where there was kind of like weakness. 
and I didn't feel like the, the setup menus are still very easy to navigate. I didn't feel like they, they went so far off and left field that we have to relearn an entire new you know system. Guys, this thing, if you've been watching my videos for the 3,000 videos or whatever it is that we've done, um, I think we're gonna be pretty close. We're gonna be able to, um, the forward programming is a big part of this. And by the way, we have some forward programming videos coming. I know it's gonna be painful and some of you guys, there's one guy that's got a picture of a horse and I forget his name. Anyway, he's been all excited about like training on these and I'm, I'm, I'm training you in my videos, guys. Just watch the videos. Um, all of them, the whole thing. <laughs> watch them again. But anyway, I, I, the new lineup has probably got some of you thinking, oh, here we go again. And you're rolling your eyes and you're like, I just, just finally got a DX. Listen, there's people still using Gen 1 DX and they're doing just fine. And they're gonna work for years to come. Don't worry about it. Just trust me. If you got a DX6 and you are really stretching the budget to get it, you're not gonna be in hot water for a very long time. Okay, trust me. But that being said, there may be some features here and there that come up on the newest stuff. So this is gonna be good for that. Now, am I gonna go to the DX, the, the NX6 for my DX18? I don't know yet. It kind of depends on how this works with the P51. I trust it's gonna work just fine. It's gonna be easy to use, it's similar. I have all the switches that I regularly use because I tie all of my Expo to this. And I have my throttle cut. Actually, I tie all my Expo I don't know if it's that one or this one. That I feel one, like the, the one on the front. The one on the front. Yeah, yeah that's right. Because I don't actually use that for anything. But the thing that's cool is you can still Sorry. do a lot with this transmitter for being an only a six channel radio. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, it is still fairly expensive. Um, but the investment you make in your transmitter is an investment in peace of mind. It's, a, it's an investment in longevity because these things are going to be out for 10 plus years. Um, and even if they come out with a better one, you know, it's not going to make this one not work. Mm -hmm. Spectrum is really good about reverse compatibility. Um, I've learned that from personal experience. There's still people using like DX7s and things like that. Things that have been long since discontinued um, and they're working fine. So that being said, guys, don't freak out. If you're like me, change hurts and you run from it. Yes. Um, but that being said, I think this is probably going to be a good change. I feel like the reverse compatibility nature of this is going to be a good thing. So without further ado, obviously this part of the video, this unbox part, is going to be um, kind of almost separate from the P51 setup, but we are going to go through the full setup on this transmitter, this very transmitter. So I need to get it plugged in because I my, my transmitter pack appears to be at about half voltage. Keep in mind the lithium ion has a very wide range of discharge, like you, you run for a longer range. The lithium ion runs on the very, very, very top range. Lithium ion runs lithium for a long time. Polymer. Lithium, yes. Lithium, lithium polymer, like our, like our flight packs, um, they discharge and you only operate till about maybe like 80, 85% of the range. And then it just dies really quick. Lithium ion, you might run um, like 60% before it starts to drop off, like in your power tools, your drills and things like this. So anyway, um, I'm excited about this. It's not like a game changer for me because I have an awesome transmitter. But the thing is, if you guys are looking for a transmitter, this might be the thing to do. Obviously, we're gonna link to this. If you buy it from the links, you do help to support the channel a lot, especially on the bigger ticket items. So if you're thinking about it, if you get some help from us, that's the way you can pay us back if you want to. It's just buy stuff from the links, you're gonna buy it anyway. Don't go buy stuff you're not gonna buy. That's stupid, just buy it if you want it. Um, but you support us by buying it from our links because then Horizon knows that you bought it from our links. It helps us financially a little bit. And uh, I mean, nobody's getting rich off of it, but the thing is it does help to keep us running this channel. So my camera crew is shaking her head. So, I mean, she tolerates a lot of this and we're very happy to have her um, as part of this channel. So we're very fortunate that she is this tolerant <laughs> of me. <laughs> All right, we'll be back with the rest of the unbox on the P51. It's gonna be a long video, long video warning. Okay, so we forgot to talk about one thing about charging this. So this is the Spectrum 30 amp power supply. There's nothing especially special about this for what we're gonna be doing. Um, obviously, this is how we charge our batteries when we use the high quality smart chargers. But in this case, I'm just gonna use it for a USB port. Well, let's turn this one on. 
I'm plugging it in because there's a five amp or five volts at one amp plug. And then this is where you can plug in your charger. And then the charge is working. Oh, that's cool. So you can tell where your charge level is. Oh, nice. That's really nice. Okay, so now the other thing is, if you want to adjust this so that there's, there's more, oh, there's switches in there. I don't know what that does. It did come with a manual. Oh, I know. Nobody wants to read the manual. I know. Okay, that must be how you do that somewhere. I'm not sure where you do it. I had to take these off on the other ones. So anyway, all right, that's how you charge it. It comes with the manual, so this is the mystery tool. Come back for more guys, stick around for the P51 setup. YouTube, it's Brian Phillips. We've got something new for you, except it's not. The P51D 1.2 meter, June 9th, and we've got something that is new, the NX6, which is the new lineup of Spectrum receivers, or transmitters rather. And we are excited to show you how it works. We're gonna go over the setup of this plane from unbox to radio setup. And then we're gonna give you a quick look at some of our thoughts on this. Obviously, we're gonna fly it today, right now. Sun's just setting. Hopefully, we get a good flight in for you. We're on 4,200 all the way forward. Flaps in the takeoff setting. And uh, we're gonna hope for the best. We had a kind of a crazy windy weekend like crazy, crazy, crazy windy weekend. Really good ground handling with this plane. You gotta make sure you keep, uh, keep it from nosing over. So the wind is kind of crosswind, so here we go. Gorgeous. Out of the retracts there. Got about 30% throttle there. I have never flown with this receiver or transmitter. And so I'm just kind of taking it easy. That thing is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. There's full throttle on 4S. As you can see, she gets around very good. Out of the throttle altogether. Need just a little bit of down trim here. So far, very happy with the way this transmitter works. It's not a huge jump from what we had before. Take off flaps there. Okay, right in front here. Mm -hmm. This is the first time I've used this transmitter and the first time I've flown this plane. It is a true maiden for me. 50% throttle here. Take off flaps out of the flaps, full throttle, 4S power. It's getting kicked around a lot with the wind right now. I can hear a decal mm -hmm. flapping. Yep. Man, that thing just looks awesome. Yeah, it does look good. I'm having to give a little bit of down pressure under full throttle, take off flaps coming in. Gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Let's go to the bowl. I did not set up any sort of rudder mix on this plane. And I think that a rudder mix would make sense for a little bit nicer looking, tighter coordinated turns for just a beautiful, beautiful pass here. That thing looks so stinking gorgeous. Out of the flaps, full throttle, and straight into the near unlimited accelerating vertical. Full throttle here. We're flying into the wind right now. Just to give you guys an idea of what we're working with. Need a little bit more nose down attitude here, so I need to trim it. I don't know which thing is rocking. Do you hear the decal? I do. Okay, full landing flaps. We're gonna show you the wide flight envelope. Look at this, guys. Look at this. Oh, I can see it now. You see it? It's on the right wing, mid wing. There's something flopping. Look at that gorgeous, gorgeous looking plane. Man, it's so fast. We're gonna show you safe here in a minute if we get around to it, obviously. <laughs> okay, so here's some safe. Oh, sorry, gear. Guys, I apologize. They're safe. Out of the throttle, just gliding along. Just kind of bring it back toward us, no throttle. Full safe flight mode right there, not even looking at it. 
We'll give it a little bit of throttle. We'll just show you kind of the limited bank angles. That's 50% right stick into the throttle. There's full right. Here's full left. You can see the limited bank angles. Got plenty of rudder authority still, so you can kick it into a nice coordinated looking turns. No flaps right now, folks, just to keep it clear. The safe really does well with this plane. I think some of these, uh, some of these 1.2 meter planes and in the 1.2 meter Warbird line, some of them do better with safe and others don't. They all work, but some of them are just easier to fly. Like the flyability is very good on the P-51 with safe. Look at this. I'm still in safe, guys. Look at the up. That's awesome. It's almost like not a limited bank angle on up. How about down? Let's try that. Okay, out of the throttle, full down. That's a pretty good limited bank angle. You can actually buy the thing in safe. Sweet, okay, I'm out of safe now. According to my term with a little bit of rudder so I can go real sharp, full landing flaps here. We're gonna really slow it down, give you guys a dirty pass here with the gear coming down right now, beautiful. Look how slow that thing is, guys. This is gorgeous. Out of the gear, out of the flaps, into the throttle. 4S just gets this thing going, guys. Even with those drop tanks on there, no problems. Okay, let's try a landing. Take off flaps, landing flaps, bringing it in. About 15% throttle. I don't want to force it, so we're going to go around, up and around. Got the countdown on my NX. Okay, that was about, I think I have my volume at 50%, but I want to look down. Should be no problem landing. The wind has calmed down quite a bit. Take off flaps, landing flaps. You can see the uh, little bit of updraft there. Okay, just carrying a little bit of power. You want to be about 15% throttle. Look at that, look at that. First landing in the grass, just to show you can be done. Don't you tip over, throttle cuts on. Let's go look at it. I'm 26 seconds past my timer. So I just barely made it past my timer, and I do have the voltage tester. Oh, okay. This plane is very manageable. In dead calm conditions, it's gonna be one of your easiest flying planes. As you can see with landing, it kinda handles the grass okay. Um, would I wanna take off and land all the time from grass? Probably not. Let's see what is wiggling around on here. There was one oh, piece of- there it is. Yep. Oh, it's just some hinge tape. Okay, no big deal. I can tape that back down, no problem. In fact, we might pause it. We'll try a 3S flight second. The 4S obviously has way more power than you really need. On the P51, you almost need the 4S to really get that enjoyable, crazy power. On the P51, excuse me, on the, on the P47, I feel like the 4S is almost needed. But on the P51, I feel like the 4S is just like overkill. So we're gonna try it on 3S, but I had trouble getting the CG at the recommended points, which was 85 plus or minus three millimeters from the leading edge mm -hmm. at the wing root. Yep. I felt like the 4S got us a little closer to where we need to be. So instead of using a 2200 3S, we're probably gonna jump it up to the next size up and we'll probably go like 3000. We're gonna let you know that in just a second and fix that tape. Okay, so we took a quick second and we went into our menu this is something I didn't do earlier. And I went into the telemetry. And this is something you can always try is the auto config. And it's gonna attempt to set it up so that you can see what type of telemetry you've got available. And on the Air 636Bs, we usually just had the receiver, the flight pack. Um, not even the flight pack, but we had the receiver voltage. So that's all I could find on it. Um, first impressions on the transmitter, very good. I didn't notice anything crazy. The only thing I noticed is I could use a little bit more Expo. So I'm gonna go into my dual rates and Expo. Oh, you know why there's more Expo? Because I had to copy the model and I forgot to do it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up our standard settings, which is gonna be five. Whoops. I'm gonna assign that to switch F. I'm gonna set the middle setting on ailerons to 10, the low setting to five, and the top setting to Let's go to like 20 and then down to 90 for the rates. Then we're gonna switch the elevator, assign it to switch F. We'll set the low to five, the median point to 10 and the high point to 20. And we'll lower the rates to 90. 
and then we'll scroll over to rudder, go down to the switch, assign it to F, and we're gonna leave that. We're gonna go to, let's probably do five, then we'll do 10, then we'll do 20. You guys are noticing a pattern probably here. And then we'll just save that. Okay, so we're ready to rock and roll. So we're at seven minutes on our timer. I wanna go ahead and pull this battery pack and show you what type of uh, voltage we have remaining, how much life we have. They give us a five minute flight timer um, recommendation. And on 2200 4S, you can see I had that battery way up in there. So let's see what we've got left. Now I was fixing that tape joint that we heard kind of buzzing as we were flying. So that took us a minute or two. So we're at 7.45 on a five. So we're at 24%. We didn't really push it too bad, mm -mm. but I would say five minutes is probably a safe place. You're not gonna get stuck in a, a, a dangerous condition. Now, I'm just gonna let you guys know this. This battery is the next one I'm gonna try. It's 3200, but it is not fully charged. So I'm actually just gonna use this to demonstrate the size, the fit, and the CG. But I want you to be aware, I want you to be aware of where we're starting. So we're at about 84%. So 84% just because we're gonna lose our sunlight and thus the opportunity to film. And we've had just really bad weather. The last week has been horrific. We've actually been trying to film this for like a week. So here we go. So the 3200 seems to fit in there laterally just fine. Um, I felt like maybe we needed just a hair more nose weight. Uh, this little tray is actually somewhat helpful, but if you have a wider battery, it makes it a little bit hard to tell when you're lined up. And that's what I'm struggling with right now is just getting it lined up. Okay, I got it lined up. And I feel like it's not wanting to get started for some reason. I have another idea. I'm gonna put the tray in first this time. Slide that in. Oh, it's my Velcro. My Velcro is getting caught. Oh, okay. The Velcro strap is getting caught on this side. On We're just gonna pull that through. On the track. On the track. So we have flown with a P-51 before on the Blondie, which was one of my first planes, third or fourth plane. And uh, loved the plane, had very good luck with it. Flew it to death, practically. It's actually not dead though. It's mm -hmm. still sitting in our basement. I don't fly it much anymore because it's just been a long time since I've flown that. I wonder if it just doesn't like this size of pack. We'll pause it and get it in there. Okay, so we had a hard time getting that tray in, so we just slid the tray in and then slopped the battery in there, so no big deal. Uh, the CG feels still almost a little bit, it still feels almost a little bit tail heavy according to the recommendations from Horizon Hobby. So we'll see, if, it felt like it was flying pretty good, so we'll see. Wind's coming right at us here. That feels a little better actually. The heavier battery is actually good, I think. Oh, it's gonna disappear on us, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's so weird, because the last time I flew this plane was Esteban. So on 3S, on 3S, it's got plenty of power, I think. Don't have the buzz anymore, which is nice. Take off flaps there just to bring it around a little quicker. What a beautiful plane, beautiful backdrop, gorgeous fall evening. Now, just to be clear, we started with 84% life in this pack. I was doing kind of a speed charge on it just to get something through. Plenty of elevator authority, plenty of rudder authority, plenty of aileron authority. I don't feel like we're giving anything up right now. Watch how fast she'll slow down. It's like putting the brakes on, guys. She'll fly right by. Look at this. Look how slow you can fly it. I mean, I'm not in that big of a space here, guys. We're about one acre here up front. Maybe a little bit more. And I'm flying basically in that area. 
full speed pass on 3S. Sorry, camera crew. I'm just loving the way it flies. It flies every bit as good as my Blondie did. It does all the things I want it to do. Still need just a, t a little touch of trim on the nose. I just feel like it handles handles the wind nicely too. Okay, let's do a nice slow pass. Really bring it in nice and slow here, right down the runway. You good, camera crew? Mm -hmm. Just to show you just how crazy slow it can go. Full throttle on 3S, 3200 milliamp, not quite unlimited vertical, but pretty close. Give it a nice stall turn there. Still not dead calm tonight, guys. Full landing flaps coming in. That thing will turn on a dime with the landing flaps and you just feel in control because you are. I need you on my right. Thank you, good job. So now this 3200 seems to be a pretty good match for size. A pretty good match for weight, but we did have a little bit of trouble stuffing it in the hole. You know, so with some practice, I'm sure we could figure it out. High speed pass here. It is calming down a little bit as we go. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Gorgeous purple sky. Backdrop, takeoff flaps here, getting over the top of the trees. Those invasion stripes look so cool. Okay, full landing flaps here. Watch you how slow and controllably you can do this. Absolutely no problems keeping it in these tight quarters. Horizon would not necessarily market this as a tight quarter flyer, but I tell you what, it flies pretty tight. Okay, I wanna see if I can do a touch and go if I get lucky. Actually, we'll probably try to land it here. Out of the throttle altogether, about 10% throttle. Good, we'll just roll in the grass. It's easier to get it arrested there. I gotta say, this plane does not leave anything. I, I just feel like it, it leaves everything on the court. It's, it's there, you, you want it to turn, it turns. You don't want it to stall, it doesn't stall. We're 58 seconds from the end of the timer. I'm sure we got plenty of power. We could probably go for a ways. Now, thoughts on the NX6. Really good, very easy to set up. I was scared to death as soon as I heard that they were doing this because I said, oh no, great, we get to learn a new system and I don't want to learn a new system. Oh, and you've got that thing too, which I don't know why you would need that. Here, hold, show them again so you can see it. Oh, yeah. So anyway, uh, I think that this is a great transmitter. It does all the old things that you used to be able to do, but it's got some new tricks up its sleeve. I haven't even learned them all yet. In fact, I've learned like none of them. <laughs> but the thing is, I really like it. It's very easy to go from what you have to what this is if you decide to make an upgrade. The screen is very easy to see. Um, and you'll see that if you stick around. The only thing I noticed that was of less quality was the vibrate was a little bit less intense. But like, you know, that's not a big deal. I don't want it to vibrate off the counter when I have it giving me the uh, the inactivity warning. Right. So other than that, I really like it. I ended up getting the bigger pack in here, which we'll show you that also. Uh, it comes with uh, a fine battery, but the thing is I just want a little bit more life out of it. So the other thing is the sticks feel really good. They feel just, I mean, honestly, they feel just about as good as my DX18, which is a far more expensive uh, transmitter. Um, the charger is just through a USB port, which is super nice in case you end up don't have your, your weird drum style connector with you. Um, also, if you have more than one type of transmitter, you can of course charge more than one type of transmitter with the same thing, that's always nice. I was a little bit disappointed it didn't come with a lanyard. I mean, some guys don't use lanyards. Of course, I have a lanyard, the DX18 lanyard. And being that this is a DX or an NX6, I'm assuming that the higher levels are gonna come with some of those goodies and accessories. 
Um, and then I'm almost certain that Horizon is offering one that comes with receivers. So I, I typically don't get them that way because when I get them, I'm just getting them for the transmitter itself. But when I was new at this, that might've been a consideration if I was getting into some sort of a uh, homemade foamy or something like that. Let's go take a look at this plane. Uh, great plane. Uh, let's do some taxiing for you guys at home. I'm gonna full, uh, full up elevator there. And uh, just so you guys know what's going on, it's cold. Oh, see, I must, I must be in front of a rock or maybe caught on some grass. On short grass, this would do. This is pretty okay. short grass, but we have a lot of rocks in this yeah. area. That's why it looks so crappy right now. We had a really dry season too. Okay, so out of the flaps. Yeah, I think you could land on grass, no problem, but you'd have to have a little bit more manicured grass than this. Mm -hmm. This is pretty nasty stuff. If you had a, a smaller grass, like a Kentucky blue, I think you'd be okay. Our sod would be okay. But this stuff is a more rough, like a fiscue grass mix. Mm -hmm. So beautiful playing guys. If you haven't experienced the P51 1.2, I'll tell you what, compared to the 1.5, you're gonna hate me Horizon. I prefer flying this. It's, it's a cheaper experience. It's less stressful. The P51 and the 1.5 meter um, didn't do as good with the tail wheel down. This one does really good. I didn't really demonstrate it well today because we've got a little bit of crosswind. It's hard to tell because we came off of a day where it was just like crazy windy. I can't believe we're filming this now. No. But the thing is the P51 and the 1.5 meter is just beautiful. It's got all the features you could ever want, but it's bigger. It's definitely more intimidating. I mean, the landing gear with the, you know, with the struts and the oleos that move and all that, it's just gorgeous. Of course, the retractable tail wheel. Um, it's just one of those things you don't want to break because it's such a beautiful piece. But then you get this and it's just like, it's still beautiful, but you can fly it and it's stress-free. And if this is your third or fourth plane, especially with safe, you should be able to get it on the ground, no problem. Just keep up elevator so that you bring the tail to the ground. Uh, ground loops are not a big problem on this plane. The P51, is, is good for that. The P47 uh, was a little bit more ground loopy, if I remember. Uh, Esteban had the, the P47, and we flew a lot with that thing. Really good plane. In fact, he still has it after many, many massive crashes. <laughs> so anyway, this thing is beautiful. It's every bit as good as I thought it was gonna be, and I knew it was gonna be good because I've already flown it. The NX6 was surprisingly easy. There was almost nothing that I had trouble with, with the exception of one glitch that I noticed, and I've already communicated Horizon about it. And that was when I turned the flap off on auxiliary, it was auxiliary one. Mm -hmm. I disassociated it from flaps and moved it to gear or something else just to test, and then it wouldn't let me put it back. So I'm sure they're gonna fix that. It's just some sort of a glitch in the software. Um, I was able to just make a new model and fix that. So it wasn't that big a deal. Um, I did have to recreate the model, which is a pain. But other than that, I would say, given that it has Wi-Fi connectivity and pretty much every other feature that you get in the most expensive Gen 1 models, uh, with the, I mean, this actually has eight channels. It's called a six, but I'm controlling safe on off. Here's safe. So safe is on. Flaps, not a shared channel. Safe on off. Of course, the retracts, but I'm holding it in the hole, so I don't want to... Okay, so there's the retracts. Obviously rudder, elevator, and ailerons, okay? So, oh, safe is fighting me, ailerons. So as you can see, six channel radio covering everything. Of course, the throttle too. Um, what more can you ask from a starter transmitter? I would say this is, this is a great place to start because you wanna be able to control your retracts, you wanna be able to control your flaps, and you don't wanna have to compromise on that. You don't wanna have to tie safe to flaps. You don't want to have to tie safe to your retracts. That's just hokey. You want to be able to fly the way you want to fly. And that's the way it should be. Um, if, you, if you're interested, stick around. We're going to go through the setup of the transmitter um, at the end of the build, the unbox, build, and then radio setup. That's the way we always do it. And then shortly thereafter, we're going to give you our first impressions on this. And you can kind of use that to make your decision. Check the links in the description below. You'll help us tremendously if you buy from those links when you decide to buy, which you will, because these things are both great. Um, if you decide to buy a higher level, we may be reviewing an eight or a 10 here in the next few weeks too. Um, so, I mean, I really like the six. It's great. It fits your hand great. It feels like a really expensive transmitter. Um, and not that it's cheap, it's, it's the cheapest in the line. So if it does all the tricks you want, you know, what's wrong with that? Any thoughts, camera crew? 
I, I like them both. I still really like the P51. It's a fun plane to watch. You don't feel the, scared when I fly close to us either? No. And the NX6 seems like it has good bang for its bang for the buck on what it can do. I mean. And look how easy it is to see that screen. Even yeah. at that weird angle, yep. you can see the timer, which is nice. Yep. And the audible alarms are, are nice. But they are a little bit annoying when we're filming because they talk over us. Right. And I'm like, stop. And, but you can turn it down. So if that was an issue. Yeah. Beyond that, I really like it. It's, mm -hmm. it's, easy to make the, it's easy to make the jump. That's what I wanted. I was scared to death. It was gonna be like, oh great, I get to learn some new system that I'm gonna incorporate for like one plane. Right. No, no, this thing is just like the other ones, which is great. So if you've seen any of my videos, you can go back and look at an old video and you can follow it along basically verbatim in this thing. Yep. Um, the I, I, I know the iX series has a few minor variations, but this thing doesn't seem to have any variations with the exception of better graphics, easier to see, Wi-Fi, firmware updates from Wi-Fi. You know, these things are really nice. Yeah. So mostly you want those. just improvements. It's really all improvements. There's, on the same there's no de improvements like people like to do anymore in manufacturing. <laughs> and yeah. I see it all the time because I work in industrial electronics. So anyway, that's what you get. Stick around for the build. Come back for more.